Barbarian here. Are you a game master looking for an amazing game world rich in lore and strange new creatures to run your D&D or Pathfinder 2 game in? Well, look no further than the world of Battlezoo Indigo Isles. The world of Battlezoo Indigo Isles contains everything you need to set sail for adventure. Except maybe a boat. You're, you're probably gonna have to buy your own boat. But the book itself contains a detailed overview of key locations on the Indigo Isles, dozens of story hooks and NPCs, and details on the ancient spiritual religion known as the Eld. Wow, that, that sounds spooky. Don't forget to take your weapons with you. You'll also get 15 new dragons as monsters, featuring the entire family of wild dragons from the Battle Zoo Ancestries Dragons book to help you murderize your players' precious characters. And you'll get gobs of new magic items to make them feel like they might have a chance. But they won't, will they? What's more, there are tons of new character options. 10 new ancestries, 10, and new archetypes, and subclasses, and heritages, and seven, seven familiars native to the Indigo Isles. Remember, the world of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles comes in two versions, one for D&D 5e, and another for Pathfinder 2. Oh yeah, and they're releasing the PDF right after the Kickstarter ends. If you'd like a new fantastical world to amaze your players with, Click the link below and back the Kickstarter today. Hey everyone, can you hear us? Can you hear all of us? Hear Mark talk. Stop typing. Hello, I'm talking aloud this time. Am I muted? I hope not. Hello. Hello. The boss is here. <laughs> no, uh, Steven, I'm going to need you to, to take over direction of this stream. Oh, that's right. She's suddenly a little shy because she can't direct. No the books yeah. since she's an author yeah, mm. yeah i need How to the i need to delegate mm -hmm. no i i i'm just delegating this task to you that's right You're a real leader oh. knows how to delegate steven right uh, uh, that's what i am i always say that i i supervise everything mm -hmm. i never mm -hmm. try to do any of the work although all i do is the work it's kind of stupid as i was laying out minotaurs today and then finished up Gold Crop Island today as well. Ooh. So that's not that hard. Um, do you get a free dice case if you pledge only one dollar? No, you cannot, because you have to get. Uh, so yes, we we launched the Jewel of the Indigo Isles, not Jewel of the Indigo, the Indigo Isles World Guide. And if you read the fine print, you have to get a physical, a physical tier a physical tier so you have to get a book or something already that has shipping for you to get the free dice case so if you get the pdf or the foundry module you do not get a free dice case uh you basically have to get something that ships it because otherwise you could also buy the dice case because that's basically the same price it's going to cost for shipping so you might as well just buy it and get it um so yes anyhow um, but if you want, you can do the $1 tier now, and then as long as you're pledged before tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, you are in the queue and you will automatically get your dice case, even if you change your order. So you can change your order as much as you want, once you, as long as you don't cancel it. Once you cancel it, it takes it out, but I do it by timestamp. So there's a timestamp, and then anyone who's timestamped within the first 48 hours just gets it. And it'll be automatically added to your um, order. You don't need to worry about it. It's just there. So That's very exciting. It is exciting. I actually have... Where's the dice case? I have one here. I gave one out at Origins, which I realized was stupid because I only Ooh. had one of each. And I gave it as a bribe to someone in our game of Oath, and I lost it. <laughs> so anyhow, here is uh, here's a dice case. But look, it's actually pretty Ooh. cool. Look, you can see it says Roll for Combat on it. And uh, oh. and then has the Dyson. Look at that. Nice. My gem dice. Oh. But it doesn't come with yeah, the gem they, dice. Yeah. And they it has fit a in magnet. there quite nicely. Yeah. And you can take this out if you want and then just like throw a ton of dice in here. But it has a magnet. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that. It's actually. Hear that? It's a good dice case. And you get that. Yeah, free, the Mike. magnetic closure is very nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I've someone who has a million dice cases around. Mm -hmm. uh, this one was good, and they just added that. Like, they're like, "Oh, do you want your logo?" I'm like, "Really?" They're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Does it cost anything?" And it was like, mm -hmm. "Not really." I was like, "Okay, it's sure." And then they did it. I was like, "Damn, that's nice." The brown one actually looks better, um, and it's just easier to see than the black one. 
Yeah, but, yeah. Yep. Uh, anyhow, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, is it possible to get the Eldemon Strange and usual weird books at the Kickstarter price? Uh, I don't know what the Kickstarter price was because those were all like combined, but people have been asking me for the put them as add ons uh, to this Kickstarter. The only reason I did it is because I didn't want people to wait until January or February when the book gets shipped because you can get them now. But if people don't mind, because I guess some people would rather just get one shipment and not pay that and stuff. That's fine. So I'm going to add, uh, I'll add it shortly. I've just been a little busy, but I'm going to add it to the Kickstarter. You could always do it later too. Like, even if you don't do it right now, you could always add and change your orders whenever you want. So, um, yeah, you also have a question, Steven, what if the roles aren't for combat? Do you have a role for skill check box as well? Uh, mm. I, they're always for combat because everything can be considered combat because everything is considered a, um, it's adversarial. Adversarial. That's that was the word I was looking Even, for. Even I remember we had to roll one time for a non-combat in the encounter. I said roll for initiative. You we were like roll for combat. I was like, but we're not fighting them. Um, you're you're fighting in your mind. You know the funny thing is against against the the previous versions of yourself. Everything is conflict. So conflict is mm. combat. It could have been roll for conflict, but that didn't really mm. sound as good. You You're know, the right. funny thing is, is the only reason that can't, I did that is because when I started the the site and everything, I was like, okay, you got to come up with a catchy name. It's like a, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah, there's a lot of science behind it and the, like the length of the name, it, number of syllables. It's actually a great mm -hmm. um, scene in uh, that movie about Nike. And they were saying in the beginning, it's like, oh, why'd you call Nike? It's like, ah, because the marketing people said I needed a name that was four letters. <laughs> and it's like I'm like, yep, pretty much. It's like there's a lot of what goes into these things. So I was like, all right, I need something that rolls up, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, roll for initiative already obviously taken quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Everyone had it. But then I'm And just initiative like, is also like a, a long oh, word. It terrible, is. terrible word. Yeah. It is. Uh way you, too you long. You know though, hard. Jess, I think there's something deep about the idea of being fighting with alternate like the ghosts of alternate versions of yourself in any mm -hmm. given situation that yeah. helps to understand the mindset of many different types of gamers. No. Like thinking about it after after you said it. Like as an optimizer, right? Like I optimize sometimes. I'm not trying to optimize. I'm not comparing myself necessarily to the monsters on the field or to my fellow players, but instead to the ghost of the alternate version of myself well, who made the other decision. You know, there's the right. four different types of gamers, right? I mean, that's like well known. That, I mean, everybody that, divides yeah. gamers up into whatever their own types are. And just like Myers Briggs, it's like is someone really one side or the other but well, yeah i do know several different divisions yeah well for video games that's actually they use that all the time that's like very well mm -hmm. used because the I forgot the name of it but there's one so you're either a helper you're either a achiever which the, the, is the one exploration of them, or, one. or exploration or yeah. a griefer and mm -hmm. that's pretty accurate it's mostly for mmos but you'd be mm -hmm. so now not everyone is just one of those categories but when you really break it down uh when i used to go to gdc and we do like uh you know like surveys or like uh workshops on it it's stunning mm -hmm. like the like 90 ish percent of people do fall into those categories and and it is it is the, the biggest one really is the griefer because those they really yeah. have to deal with uh, the other ones they just have to make sure you have something for them to do in the game and yeah. the griefer believe it or not they even have to make sure there's something for griefers to do <laughs> you need to stop them from griefing in as bad of a way they channel them into griefing in ways that are more socially acceptable in mm -hmm. other words mm -hmm. yeah I see I, that. it's hard to do it's actually that there was a lot of this was back in like the 1990s when i was going to gd game developers conference mm -hmm. and this is back when like you know mmos were just taking off and we would go into workshops and we have these long discussions about how to deal with it and like we would talk to these guys these are like people from blizzard and sony and they're like yeah we literally have a meeting with the fbi and the cia every week like that's how bad the griefing was it's like we have to deal with this to, at that level 
Like every yeah. week they have to deal with law wow. enforcement. It was really, yeah, it was a serious thing. And the CIA too? Yeah, sometimes because some people were like nuts and they were like stealing people's identities and crap. It was like nuts. Whoa. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is wild. Like for a lot of these divisions of different player types, I've found that no matter what your division is, I'm usually most of the things that are in the division so like you know the magic the gathering johnny timmy spike vorthos right. and melvin mm -hmm. i'm all of those right and um to a fairly significant degree in in most of the categories but griefer is one of the ones i'm not it's one, oh, God, I hate mm -hmm. one of the only ones i'm not and that i just can't really deal with it very well and it makes me yeah. very uncomfortable yeah i'm definitely an explorer and I used to be a completion achiever. I've gotten better with that because I mm. felt it was it was really holding me back. So now I'm more mm -hmm. like the explorer type, and um, and I, I you know help her to an extent, but yeah, you know when it's... griefing helps, like in a play test, then you do grief though. Like that time <laughs> you you griefed on at Gen Con that play test game. Well, that's different. That's stress testing. So yes. strangely, I'm <laughs> extremely good at stress testing. Excuse me, and griefing in like a game setting, or you see, yeah. that's edge edge case testing, and and that mm -hmm. I'm very good, and that's that's something that's a skill too, but that's best used in moderation and in controlled environments. I never do that in my own <laughs> games or in even games I play because I don't want to break a game that I'm playing because then it'll break. I'm like, I don't want to break my own game, but someone else's yeah. game, if you're like just t testing it out and want to see how it plays, well, I'm your man. I will destroy your yeah. game happily. Anyhow. Oh, Jess, you're yeah. here. How are you? I'm here. I'm doing well. And uh, do you have new hair, I see? Uh, yes, I do. You see? Well, since I decided to go to Gen Con, I had to go get my hair done. Mm hmm I have new hair, too. Oh. Yeah, I cut one strand. That's it. Can you tell? There we go. I mean, you have to, you have to keep it all manicured, you know? You have to keep it under control, I, tamed. I, I used to have long, beautiful, luscious hair, and now it's all garbage i actually can grow it out pretty long but then it ends up looking like looking like mark's hair so who mm. wants that <laughs> <laughs> there you go so that is that's why you don't do it that's right i don't know how you can have your wow. hair on your neck mark it drives me crazy when the hair when your hair's on your neck you always get it drives really you hot. crazy yeah, because it, it would hurt crazy. your neck to no have it, hair it makes it really hot i don't really like that. oh mm, really mm -hmm. not for me mm. yeah see but this is why I have an undercut. Uh huh. I see. Mm. Wow, that's some good dye job. They even did the undercut. Yeah. Well, I mean, then when it grows out, it starts looking real funny. But you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, then you just get it dyed again. Yeah. I mean, like I could go for appointments more frequently, and my hairstylist will uh, charge me just what she charges for like bang trimming if I go in to get my undercut touched up, and mm -hmm. like she would die for me again but it, it's just like a lot of effort mm, too much effort now you die to... another day die another day oh mm -hmm. you're so funny mark does your mom <laughs> tell you that my mark he's such a funny it would be boy. more something my dad would probably say since he's the james bond fan oh mm -hmm. there you go um, all right so today we are gonna talk all about gnomes nothing but yes. gnomes gnome culture what they yeah. eat what they do what are your favorite time. what are your favorite gnomes steven because i'm partial to those eberron gnomes the, the eberron, eberron gnomes are pretty cool and how they're like mm -hmm. kind of like a secret police that are terrifying yeah. um yeah i would also say that i want to find out about gnomes like which of the three hosts is a gnome and why uh, which of the three of us is a gnome and why? Ooh, ooh. I mean, we're all kind of like different types of gnomes, maybe. That's possible. Like, oh, no. Stephen is one of those Eberron gnomes. He might be, yeah. And he's just yeah. going to um, seem like he's harmless, but he's connected mm -hmm, to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. Whereas you're a Galarian gnome because of the yeah. fact that you have brightly colored hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, sometimes do mischievous things when it comes to your mm -hmm. pcs mm -hmm. what are that the, uh, the bleached true. gnomes i like those oh the bleachlings yeah the steven might be a bleachling 
They're they're interesting. They're actually they're they're pretty interesting. I always think of did you ever see the episode of Enterprise when they go see the Andorians and then they find out there's like these blind Andorians and they're all bleached and they live like underground and they're mm-hmm. like a whole subsection. I think of that like I'm like, oh that's like the bleachling gnomes. It's the Andorian bleachings. So I always think of that one. It's kind of cool. So what kind of gnome does that make me? A keen spark? I don't think I'm grumpy enough to be a keen spark gnome, mm. although like I do like inventing things. Mm. Well, yeah, the um what is it? Like the Forgotten Realms gnomes are very like inventor tinker gnome kind of mm. a thing. Oh, I think Kryn uh Dragonlance ones are super tinker, but they're like mm-hmm. they're well beyond the pale on just like all their stuff is weird and messed up. Right, 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 right. Or I'd be a red cap, but red caps aren't gnomes. Those oh. are dwarves. Those are uh, those aren't even dwarves. Those are um they're, they're like fae. fae. They're fae, yeah. 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 That's not a gnome. I know. But people can confused. gnomes are related to fae and Galarian. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. Well, we took this pretty far. This um <laughs> yeah. this thing that this was a gnome. Episode. I'm sorry, everybody yeah. who came here for Rage of Elements. Uh, we oh, wait, question. we have a super chat. They got a uh, helpful draw was gonna help us, us out on by track. Lead, leading us um leading us onto track. Okay. As a designer, uh, said, as a designer how right. do you feel about kineticist as a character that neither strikes nor casts a spell, or at least not exactly? It's definitely mm-hmm. definitively been a challenge for me, says a helpful draw. Yeah, so. so I didn't write anything related to the kineticist. Uh, I wrote other sections of the book. So for me, my first look at the kineticist was the play test, and then when the book actually released, like for everybody else. So I I've been watching a lot of the content discussing the kineticist because for me, without having access to it in Path Builder, it can be difficult for me to really like conceptualize the way that a character comes together. It's mm. difficult for me to sit down and just like read the book. Mm. So watching watching YouTube and then being able to fiddle around in um in in Path Builder is very helpful for me. So so far, I like the kineticist a lot. I like the way that other people have compared it to being like the Thaumaturge, where you can like really customize it and make it like exactly the way that you want it to be, like whether you want to be in melee or at ranged or focusing on damage or doing support. I like the way that you can customize your experience. As far as being neither strikes nor casting a spell, I think that it occupies like a really interesting and engaging space. I think that the way. Yeah. No, it's just because you wrote the original Kineticist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to hear the end of what Jess was saying. Oh, sorry, first. I didn't mean to. I didn't know you were you weren't on. Keep going, Jess, oh, and then I Mark was... follow up. <laughs> I think I think Mark can go ahead right now. I might have just been like getting ready to ramble and repeat myself. <laughs> oh no, that's fine then. Um, in that case, yeah. So I wrote the original Kineticist for Pathfinder First Edition, and um, I definitely enjoyed it. It was one of my first two classes that I wrote for Paizo. There's definitely a lot going on there with like the team at the time of people had a lot of people who were very Stephen King, like kind of carry <laughs> and fire starter, which were not my mm-hmm. jam and not books that I had read. Uh, but I had a lot of other newer sources that I wanted to bring in too. And I think that we wound up with a class that had all of those influences and did a really good job at that for PF1. But I have to admit, I was always hoping that in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it could get another look that used mm-hmm. the the action economy from Pathfinder 2nd to its yeah. fullest, because I had to do a lot of pledges in Pathfinder 1 to try to get the action economy on things to work and brought ideas like infusions and composites and all of those different elements, that having the elements inside your body and messing around with you with your constitution and really did something cool in Pathfinder 2. And... Um, Sadly, like the big, I'd say the saddest thing for me out of everything from um, leaving and going to roll for combat right before Rage of the Elements, which I still am very happy that I did, very, very happy, Mm -hmm. was not being able to work on the Kineticist. But Mm -hmm. I'm very, I think the Kineticist is awesome. And I'm very happy with what we got in terms of the Kineticist class here. I would go so far as to say that. the Kineticist is one of the best classes that I've seen, having not had enough time to 
deep dive into a lot of the specifics yet, but still looking through things. Now, granted, part of what allows classes to be awesome, have very specific and evocative abilities that give you a lot of options, is page count. And the mm -hmm. Kinesis has way more page counts than, um, than most classes are allowed to have. So uh, in that sense, I would hope that it would be able to be in the, in the top classes that it does not let me down. It uses action economy in great ways as mm -hmm. far as I can tell, um, it's got a lot of variety and different options that you can use. And it it meets like my vision and dream for what the kineticist could be in Pathfinder second edition, like pretty much on the on the mark, I would say. And like obviously people are gonna talk about, well, you know, this one ability is you could do this thing where everyone moves on the ground and takes 200 damage or something like that. It's like every class, every book that comes out when you have enough content has things like that. I don't want to focus on it, especially since some of those might be clarified with errata and like, it's going to be the thing I know half of everyone talks about because you can do some seemingly very powerful thing for a short while with it. But taking that aside, there's so many options. They look cool. A lot of the stuff that's like direct damage base with area or single target gives you variability between the two of them without going like way over what a caster could do in area if they wanted to or way over or even equal to what a marshal could do with single target if they wanted to but instead is a beautiful blend between them that lets you switch some things around that's what yeah. that's what i'm seeing from the majority of the class again i've not been able to do a deep dive mm -hmm. into into every ability well, yeah, the most interesting thing for me right now, uh, having not played it and not really had the opportunity to really go in and look at everything, but the um, the balance of like kind of tetrising together your turns and if you need to channel elements and how that kind of restricts you from using your three action uh, impulses on the round because you have to spend one action. And so the way that that constrains your actions, but then the way that once you get to 19th level and you get final gate and you can... Um, do your channel action as a free action and still get that free um, elemental blast that reverses the incentives and makes it so that every round you want your aura to be deactive unless you have a reaction you want to use like it, Wait, barring the case maybe, I'm, have maybe a, I've read it wrong but do you actually get to um it's what it says what it says that you're reading is it says you if don't you're get unable to use the cadet if you're unable to act, oh, the see. final gate still functions, but you don't get to use the elemental blast or stance Got impulse. It. That's, that's if you're that, that's like, unconscious missed, or right? restrained or something. Yeah, yeah. By yeah, it's way, easy to misread it that way. But the way that that reverses the incentives where, like, unless you have a reaction that you want to use uh, when it's not your turn, because you won't be able to use a reaction impulse if, you're, if you're, like, your aura isn't deployed. But you get another free action on your turn like you squeeze another action out of your turn where you get to make a blast as a free action if you right. did overflow on your previous turn like the way that that completely shifts the way that you play in the like the very late like 19 to 20 so cool yeah and it's still not a must-have because some of those auras are pretty strong and if you're mm -hmm. if your play style is take the freebie to blast and then do your big three thing that ends it every turn you'll never have the aura up off turn yeah yeah so there's a lot of great options there's a lot of great choices and it makes you feel like you're doing a lot of different things and so mm -hmm. it makes me just so much want to have a group that has yeah. a kineticist and like an elementalist which we can see is later on in this book and like Eldamon Trainer or Elemental Avatar from the classes that I'm in the middle of playtesting right now, because that sort of is very different from Kineticist and Elementalist in different ways. Like uh, Kineticist is so fluid and doing multiple different things to get a powerful combined effect, whereas the um, which you can generally repeat and Tetris together, whereas the mm -hmm. the Eldamon Trainer or Avatar is cycling through different abilities and you cannot combine them with tetris but they tend to be like 
uh, like more directly powerful for one on one than what one of these impulses would do. Now that yeah. I'm looking at, at both of them, and yeah, I think that's going to be great. You could, and that th you have benefits and drawbacks from each of those, and you have team element that just goes all the elements. I mean, come on. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was going to say you didn't get to work on Kinetis, but you got to instead, which is a fifty-page um, uh, class. But instead, you get to work on a three hundred-page elemental avatar and Eldemon trainer class. Which is you're not wrong. Kind of like the Kinetis, but on steroids. I would <laughs> say I wouldn't say it was like the Kinetis. No, it's on like the Kinetis. I think it's completely and, different than the Kinetis in in how it plays no, no, in the play right, style. Right. But it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sort of like if you took the Kinetis and you took a magic user, like a wizard. And combine them. That's kind mm -hmm. of the. That's kind of how the Eldemon trainer plays. Is that the yeah. the the Eldemon are kind of your spell books in a way because they give you your powers and then yeah, well, you you choose your powers from your Eldemon. So mm -hmm. elemental stuff is really core to like the the fantasy role playing, like the the fantasy of the fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I when I announced this stream, someone on Reddit was talking about how much it changes your world building based on which mm -hmm. elements you just what you decide means an element and mm -hmm. they were like how is that decided and i said it looks like in golarian you have the four classical elements and the five wujing mm -hmm. elements and those are elements and nothing else is mm -hmm. called an element even if it's an energy yeah. type or something else in the setting whereas with the philosophy of the eld in alakar which is the one that um that we're working on uh with role for combat there are 20 things that are considered elements in that philosophy, and it's much mm -hmm. broader, and ice and electricity and things are elements. And what does that mean about world building? You're absolutely right, Jess. It really changes something about the cosmology to say, no, this is an element now. Yeah. So and there was there's a part that they talked about, I think, on the Paizo um uh, primal previews stream from PaizoCon. Uh there's a piece of I believe the introduction that they talked about where there's the discussion of different like elemental philosophies and different categorizations of what is an element. And then there is uh, this goblin elementalism recently caught my eye as well as mm -hmm. their elements can seemingly be any eight to 10 nouns with a hierarchy based on the subjective necessity of said noun for an individual. More often than not, sleep, food, drinks, and fire end up being the most significant. That's awesome. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. So Cheese of Ages gave us a member chat that said, I didn't think a class could be pretty, but the lore, imagery, evocative ability, advancement, all the kineticists is like design is art. Yeah, the kineticists mm -hmm. is a fantastic class. And mm -hmm. I hope people will um, will really enjoy it as much as I have as someone who didn't work on it at all, but just thinks it's awesome and did write the first edition kineticist. This is a this is a great class. It is a brilliant and wonderful successor to the first edition Kineticist that really, I think, makes it sing even more by using Pathfinder's second edition's innovations and mechanics to bring out the full potential of the Kineticist. So I actually have the book here. And yeah. And we can switch over. And I said we were going to talk about Kineticist. So this stream we are going to kind of ask you it's kind of like a it's an ask me anything within an ask me anything how about that mark isn't that weird i like it i like it uh <laughs> there's actually two questions they already just asked with super oh, that chats quick. that we might be able to do they're both for jess although the first one doesn't say that but i've decided it's for jess uh so the first one aaron mortar said any thoughts on adding metal and wood to planescape so i've decided that one was for jess even though it didn't say yeah. it was yeah, adding metal and wood to Planescape is going to have a lot of... I mean, first of all, I don't know that you necessarily want them to be their own elemental planes in Planescape just because of the kind of like the ramifications of the para-elemental and the quasi-elemental planes that, that will have. Like you're not just adding two planes. You're adding like what? Two, three, four, a lot. Five, like seven planes? at least so that's yeah yeah it depends so that, on where you said that they were yeah. overlapping mm -hmm. probably probably eight planes then 
Probably, probably you're adding eight planes to add metal and wood to Planescape. And so I think what is much simpler is to implement metal and wood as para-elemental planes. And I think this is fairly easily done, honestly. Uh, I think that you could make metal... Um, what is the one between air and negative? Uh, the one between air and negative, is that a vacuum? Vacuum is one of the planes. I just don't remember yeah. which one that is. Air I think and, that may be air and negative. I'm looking at the sheet, the cheat sheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, so, but um, Jess is, is talking about um, D&D &D, uh, planes. Oh, D &D game. Plane yeah. Game. So okay. it has no, these other that. planes that don't exist uh, in Pathfinder. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Air, right. Between air and negative is vacuum. I think you could put metal there very, very nicely and easily. Your other option for metal is to go between earth and negative, where dust is. It just depends on whether you feel more passionately about dust as a plane, as va with vacuum as a plane, or if you want, uh, like, what you want earth to represent, and whether you want to lean into earth's connection to metal or lean into the kind of uh, decay lightning rod theming. Uh, your other option is to kind of push metal into being like the plane of lightning. Like what Planescape has is the plane of lightning is between positive and air. You could switch vacuum and lightning around and have something like vacuum in the positive slot and then put like decay metal in the the between between air and, and negative and then for wood uh you would want that adjacent to the positive plane and probably between positive and earth instead of mineral and then just fold all of the mineral stuff into the plane of earth i think that is what i would do because i don't if you want a plane of metal and a plane of wood but you already have a plane of dust and a plane of mineral, what else is the plane of Earth? So I think folding mm. mineral into Earth makes sense if you also want to have a metal that exists. That makes a good point. Yeah. That's a great answer. Hopefully that's an answer that you like there, Aaron. And then Knights of Less Call asks, Jess, what is your favorite element? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the answer to what is my favorite element and the answer to what, why did, I did not want to minimize Zoom. What are you doing? Your favorite element is churn. <laughs> no, my favorite element is air. There we go. There we go. You're an airbender. Well, no, I think I'm an earthbender because I use Tectonomancer as a username. So I think that mm -hmm. implies that I'm an earthbender. But my favorite element is air. And it was also my favorite element to write for the book because I did do the lore section for the uh, the air chapter. Hmm. And not only is air my favorite element in general, but I also really love the place uh, the the place uh, in the setting that air has now that we've introduced like the the five elements elemental cycle that doesn't have air and all of the implications that that has on air and what the air lore section needed to achieve in terms of like does air have thoughts opinions feelings uh, reactions to people thinking they're not an element um, and like what actually makes air different from the other elements to cause this uh, shift in classification. Hmm. And so that is both like a creative space that I really loved creating in. Uh, and also, also air, air, I just like air. So anyhow, air is pretty cool. And you got to write a lot of the air sections in the book, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say, we can take questions which we've been doing because the book is so big we can talk about anything kineticists alone could probably talk about for the whole stream and um yeah and but if people have specific questions and as usual super chats will be answered right away otherwise we might see yours but sometimes we won't um 
-hmm. if we don't see all your questions. But before we dive too deep into it, because now we seem to have a lull in questions, is that what did you write specifically, Jess? I'm curious. Uh, are you allowed to say? I... If it's I been revealed not, yeah. already that it existed, I, I yeah. believe well, everything's is, been revealed that, that exists well, this in is, terms of this the is, elements. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a, a difficult question to like get into the nitty gritty of like what did I write, what didn't I write? Because not only am I a, a little bit uh, limited in what I can reveal about the contents of the book, because as an author, it's not my place to preview the book. That is for people like Roll for Combat or Knights of Last Call or No Natter Rules Lawyer or other other like yes, but you can still tell me uh, what media you outlets did. <laughs> to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like if I were to say like I wrote blah 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 blah, but nobody had had like the the opportunity at the first scoop to reveal that that's in the book, then mm -hmm. I'm undermining their ability to have the first scoop. Well, but you public. do the have me on your out. stream and it's it's your first scoop basically so but anyway like that's that's the reason why it's a little bit mired at the moment for me to just like give a full list of like okay, let me, are all my sections. did you work but, on, you didn't work on the kineticist did you work on air <laughs> did you work on earth um, yeah so for for the <laughs> elemental lore sections i wrote um a good chunk of the introduction not all of it but a, a fair chunk of it uh, and then i did the lore sections for air earth and fire all right. So, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Derek, Earth, Wind, and Fire. That was the name of our... <laughs> when we played Avatar The Last Airbender, we realized we had air, fire, and earth. And there everyone's sitting there, no one mm -hmm. thought of it. And I said, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And everyone's like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm like... So, we know from our people. last episode that Jess wrote the uh, the Zeomorns in Earth. Yes. Because we did the, uh, um, the, the preview of Earth. And mm -hmm. that's where Jess said yeah. she wrote so, those. <laughs> yeah, out of the Earth section that we previewed on the Earth mm -hmm. stream, I did the Earth lore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I created like the narrator for that section and wrote all of that. And then I did um, the Xyomorns and also uh, the entry for Cyrazul. That's great. I went to air. I mean, or I went to fire because I like fire. Mm -hmm. So... And fire always seems to be the go-to for everyone. For it's a go-to for a yeah, lot of people. Fire, but let's show them fire. Fire is popular. People like fire, man. People mm -hmm, like the mm -hmm. fire. So when it comes to writing this, like, what direction mm -hmm. are you given by Paizo? Like, how, when you write this, like, do they say you need to cover these topics? Like, are you just getting given free reign? Like, you know, this is... You know, it's one thing to write a monster or an adventure path, but mm -hmm. it's like, okay, write about a plane of fire. It's so mm -hmm. nebulous. How do you even write yeah. this? It's so tricky and just, it's, there's no, there's like, like an element, there's almost nothing to grasp onto exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, each of the elemental sections is kind of presented in a way that is unique to that element but the overall like broad strokes of the order that the information is presented in is fairly consistent so like let me see here uh i had the the free reign to like choose what i wanted to name my section right so passionate intensity uh, that was m my choice to to name it that, and then all mm. of the subsequent section headers like fires, many faces, mm -hmm. and then uh, ha hearth and home, so where to be wary, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the exact like the order of wanting to present like an overall overview of like uh, the the plane of fire, what kind, what it is like to harness fire so not specific to the planes but like the way that fire is viewed uh on galarian um mm -hmm. different perspectives on fire and what it represents mm -hmm. or what fire magic is or like techniques for using fire magic stuff like that um and then the role of fire on galarian outside of magic as well or like uh the narrator talks about like sandy deserts scorching jungles and of course volcanoes mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have uh, getting into like adventuring sites, places that are dangerous on the plane of fire, which then goes into like settlements on the plane of fire, uh, places that you can go that might or might not be safe. 
And then the the last section is the like uh, powerful players on the plane, people who maybe you might want to uh, single out and identify as like a, a powerful people or notable people on the plane. And all of that came out of your head. That is yeah, crazy to think of this how stuff. creative puzzle <laughs> freelancers are. Like I know it's amazing. I'm like I, I'm always amazed because. I don't know. For me, writing stuff about adventures is mm. is pretty. I, I can do that, but I always found writing things for like planes and different existences uh, really tricky to do personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like a lot of the locations, some locations are new, but other locations are established places within the lore. So, mm. like. Um, uh, Zajara is not a new city. It, it, that's pulled out of Pathfinder 1. And then Medina Mudia is uh, what was formerly known as the City of Brass. I was going to ask about the City of Brass. I was like, where did mm -hmm. the City of Brass go? They changed it's it? It's not it gone. It's just that the name had to be changed because City of Brass was like a uh, D&Dism. To, it's, to it's OGL. OGL ism mm -hmm. Really? Is yep. it a City of Brass like from Arabian Nights or something? I mean, really? Uh, but the, the City of Brass, as it's presented in fantasy role-playing games that are descended from the OGL, is kind of a D&D ism mm. Yeah, some of the specifics of it makes mm -hmm. it closer to the D&D version, even though, yes, there is yeah. a version that is not the D&D version. Boo. Yeah. Boo. Yeah. That, so you have a super chat here from Stephen Power. Uh, I want to take a moment and say, holy Hannah, the artwork in this is amazing. The detail and vibrancy is absolutely stunning. Can't wait to get my copy. I can't wait to see so my good. physical copy either. I'm mm -hmm. so excited. One of your fellow Canucks, in fact, Stephen Power, look at that. Mm. Oh. Isn't it cool how there's like a different border for every element? Oh, they yeah. Really, they really feel yes. like the element. It's, that, such, like it's it. such a wonderful detail. That was uh, and then too much work. Nugs Not Drugs says, any other planes you would want to write on in the future and potentially add as bending options for kineticists, such as Creations Forge or the Void. I do like the idea of like using the what we would previously have called positive and negative energy with the kineticists. Uh, I've also always really liked, um, like obviously I love the geniekin, I love the genasi as they were introduced in D&D. &D, and they were never completely canon, but in like Planescape fan communities, the idea of like a positive Genasi and a negative Genasi was very, very prevalent a lot. And I, I think they're cool. I think like a Nagati is very cool. And so I think it's the cool. idea, mm -hmm. and so the idea of being like somebody who uses the element of negative energy in a way that is distinct from necromancy is very compelling. And keep in mind, negative energy is now called void, and mm -hmm. the void element existed for the kineticist yeah. in Pathfinder first. I wrote that element, or I guess I wrote mm -hmm. all of them, but um, and a positive um, uh, version that was like connected to wood back then, but now it mm -hmm. now wood does have healing and other things like mm -hmm. that, so it may be more of an overlap to do it with positive since you can already do. Um, what's the positive replacement again i'm i'm blanking on it right now but the opposite of void um mm -hmm. whatever it is you can do that type of stuff um with vital or whatever uh with wood yeah. already so it's probably less necessary than uh yeah. i mean not that void is a necessary element either mm -hmm. but i'm sure that there are ways that it that it could be done um the kineticist, um, there are impulses for wood that have the vitality trait, and there are also, I believe, impulses for metal that either have the void trait or have the theming of, like, because the, the plane of metal is uh, very much tied to the theme of decay. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of theme can come through in a metal kineticist. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it can already do this, basically, mm -hmm. but there, there, that doesn't mean there's not room for someone to do it, possibly mm -hmm. on infinite, because, like, you know, Paizo is going to do what Paizo is going to do and has already committed mm -hmm. way more pages to this class than any other class has had. But um, there's space for people to create this, and they made such an amazing framework that oh, it, yeah. it should be, like, very possible for someone to expand it. And I think that's a good design space. So yeah, now you absolutely. mentioned Genie Ken. 
Yeah, uh, Jess. Oh, yeah. And someone in um, Reddit, when I asked what people wanted to see from us, said that they wanted to see the genie kin, which start on yes. page. Um, what page does it start on? It seems to start on page forty six. Yes. Yeah. So that's one that I definitely want to make sure we got a look at because of yeah, um, absolutely people asking for it. And I know the genie can have been a favorite of yours too. So you might have some interesting insights for them. Yeah, I, I love the genie kin. So I wrote the Ardande, the uh, the wood genie kin. Uh, I did not write the Talos. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, it starts with uh, Man, the wood Ardande. The genie looks like a gnome. Yeah. In the yard. Well, because it's a versatile heritage, and that is a gnome. Yeah. <gasps> Remember, you it put it on anything. It all came full circle. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. was about gnomes. Yeah. And Jess wrote the thing about gnomes. Yeah, yeah. So some of my favorite things about, about the Ardande, because um, the planes of metal and wood were, like, sealed away. And so there might not have been a lot of Ardande on Galarian. Uh, during the time that those planes were sealed because they didn't exist as player options and no one could make them and no one knew that this was a thing that they should be creating characters as, right? So Ardande and Talos are more rare, perhaps, than other types of geniekin, but because, like, this book is out now, so you want to, like, if you want to play an Ardande, you you don't really want to play, like, I'm a baby who was just born, and that's my player character, right? You want to <laughs> play an Ardande that is, like, whatever age you want your character to be. And so, how is it that you go about that? How were Ardande actually around prior to the, um, the plane of uh, wood, like, actually re-emerging? And so, that was one of the, the, the kind of thoughts that I was thinking through. I was, I was, as I was creating the versatile heritage. And what I landed on was, I mean, first of all, obviously you can be someone who was born on the plane of wood and is now exploring the rest of the planes. And so like the way that someone from Galarian might want to explore the inner sphere and it's like, wow, everything is so exciting and new. This is so mysterious. Things are so different here from the way that they were back home. You can do that in reverse where you're coming to the material plane. You're just like, oh, wow, you have trees here, but they're so different from the trees where I come from. And you have trees that are right next to all of these other elements. And wow, like, this is amazing. The, the like, Galarian is incredible. And just be, like, so just enamored over the moon for the opportunity to explore Galarian. But you can also be an Ardande from the first world. Because if you, like, the, the relationship with, like, time and aging and whatnot uh, on the first world is different. And then also your your relationship with death is also going to be different if you're not on death in the first world. So I don't know if that's something you want to do. You would want to talk <laughs> to like your game master about uh, what it will be like if you die and what the ramifications are of being from the first world and dying somewhere other than the first world. But it's like, you do could... you come back as a swarm of pixies mm -hmm. automatically yeah. without yeah, yeah. chance to resurrect? <laughs> but there is... Um, I believe it's not with the player character material. I believe it's with the NPC creature Ardande. There is a sidebar that discusses first world Ardande as an option. Uh, but you can also be an Ardande who was born um, as like a, a the child of like a dryad. And maybe prior to the plane of wood re-emerging, your connection to the plane of wood was cut off. And so you are manifesting your suppressed heritage as a result of the plane of wood reemerging. That reminds uh, me of a funny story. Yeah. Uh, the being a child of a dryad, which was that Je I just put in a thing that said like that Oriads could be a child of a dryad initially yeah. in Law Zone's ancestry guide. And I like uh, during my design pass cut it with a not yet Jess. And I'm not mm. surprised that it made it back here in its rightful place with wood yeah, element. Yeah. But it was because even back then when we weren't we didn't know we were gonna do Rage of the Elements, like it hadn't gotten on the schedule. But we've been talking on the team about putting in in some ways uh the Wujing elements uh more into the game. And so mm -hmm. I was like, we're going to be blocking ourselves in here if wood gets too yeah. tied to this earth stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm mm -hmm. delighted to see that a really cool idea that just didn't work in that one place yeah. made it back into the other genie kid. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it, with an elemental framework where you don't have a plane of wood, I love the idea of playing um, Oreads like or Earth Genasi who have uh, manifestations of the way that their their element is it in like a, a more like tree woody nature direction. But within a framework uh, where wood is an element, uh, you were right to uh, remove the suggestion that you should Which play you didn't Oriad know. From like, we didn't exactly, tell you exactly. we were going to do those elements. Yeah. You you gave it the, the best mm -hmm. and put out mm -hmm. something really cool that I was just like, yeah. oh, no, I think we have to get rid of that because of something else we're doing that she couldn't have possibly known. <laughs> yeah. So this super chat from Jacques here, uh, where's the witch hat, Jess? Jacques is someone who I know, like, in real life from the broadsword club that I sometimes go to. And he does leather working. And he made a leather witch hat that was too small for his head. But because I have a tiny head, I can wear it. And so it is now my witch hat. And he's asking where it is. It is uh, downstairs, like, with all of my LARP gear. <laughs> You're gonna bring that it makes sense. You're gonna bring it to Gen Con. Uh, no, because that would be so annoying to pack and travel with. It's an mm. entire leather witch hat. It doesn't fold up. Yeah, it's like well, you don't have to pack it. Just wear it on the plane. Oh, no. my experience no. is if you pack something like that, then the TSA is always gonna also no. open it. Well, because no, but time, that's my experience. But well, they also get... usually are nerds. The people who open it yeah. are just like, I know what that is. That's so cool. It's happened to yeah. me for dice games and other stuff like that you like get almost every time entry. i've tried to bring it through you get global oh, I, yeah i have i have i have you global, global entry. entry you'll never get stuck yeah but no listen <laughs> the last time i traveled with a hat i lost it in the airport well oh i can't maybe you i can't trust myself to travel with hats <laughs> well we'll have to get you a little strap like your little kid just put it over and like tie it underneath it's difficult to wear hats and headphones at the same time, and the headphones are essential for not hearing That's the screaming true. babies. I'm going to give you everyone a hint. I'm going to give everyone the tip on headphones, by the way. I don't know why everyone uses the Apple AirPod Air earphones. First of all, they stay terrible. They never stay in your ear. Yeah. Second of all, they fall. Look, I have this. Mm -hmm. I have these. They stay in your ear. They're excellent. Yeah. Bose. And look, I've never lost them because, look, they're strapped. Yeah, I... I don't go. like the way that things like that feel inside of my ears. Me either. Fair enough. I, will, I, I, I don't like I the will fact that I can't airplanes. hear anything when the other ones fall yeah. out of my ears all the time. So. Yeah, I will on airplanes. I have some of those like loop concert earplugs. And so I will put those on on the inside of my headphones on airplanes just to like further dampen all sound. Mm. But anyway, Air, airplane travel packages. Are, uh, <laughs> oh, there's all sorts they're of an entire things about airplanes. Yeah. But, but these, yeah, that's why these I are can't... done, they look really cool. Yeah. But that's why I can't travel with the, hitch, the witch hat. I do not trust myself not to lose it. All right. We'll just get you one at uh, Gen Con. Well, I have, and then you'll have, have to wear it the whole time. <laughs> I can't. <sighs> I can't. I have my World of Darkness LARP that I'm going to, that I will be wearing a wig for. And uh -huh. the hats that you can what? wear over a wig are not the same as the hats that you can wear on your own head because of the bulk that is added to your head from the wig. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. have to anyway, be a different yeah, size. So, I don't know if the bulk yeah. added to your head is the weight of the hat. It might be the weight of something else. It's the weight of the wig. It's the weight of the weight of the ego. And she's gonna be like, This is my oh. book. I co-wrote it. And she's going to hold a pen there the whole time waiting she to sign. Did. And... She did. She's on the cover, Stephen. I know. She's on the cover. Literally her. I have, already, I have already received a request to sign a book at Gen Con from one of my three oh, fans. It's right there. Oh, wow. I'll ask you to sign a book, too. You can sign my Steven's book. Stephen's your fourth fan. You can sign I think you have book. way more than four fans, by the well, way. Well, I'm I'm counting the people who have like explicitly informed me that they are fans of my work. Well, okay, so four. perhaps there are more people. Did, but, that, did, uh, that, did that count either of us or just people no. who you didn't know? Who, no, um, because fans and and colleagues are different. Yeah, I figured. What? There are lots. I have lots of colleagues who are fans of my work, but they are not my fans. They are my colleagues. Somehow, no, it makes sense. I know a lot of, I'm not of a people, and in some sense, mm -hmm. this applies to me too. Where, when someone you know and you're friends with, or colleagues, mm -hmm. or that you know in other ways, says that your work is good, mm -hmm. that somehow it doesn't give the same validation as if it's just some mm -hmm. total rando who you know nothing about who says it. And 
it applies to me because I'm like, oh, of course, this person who I know and I like said that because they're mm-hmm. just being nice, says the voice in your head yeah. of, of yeah. imposter syndrome really? or uh, whatever it is. Yeah. But, <laughs> when it's I some rando, it... it's like, hey, this person had no reason to yeah. say that other than that they liked it. Yeah. yeah. No. Though getting getting validation from like other game designers is also like separate from getting it from friends. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so um, Ardande Origins that you can do for a character who like exists now. There's also a section, one of these sidebars talks about... Yeah, here it is. Ardande Settlements. In most parts of Galarian, Ardande bloodlines are only just beginning to return. Two families of Ardande and Tianxia, both descended from the same forest dragon, managed to retain their connection to elemental wood. While across the world in distant Arcadia, Ardande families have kept their elemental heritage intact through continued dealings with the Fae. So those are some more options for the way that you can be an Ardande now, even though the mm-hmm. Plane of Wood only just returned. We, oh, the, the is that like more versatile than um, the number of connections with Talos due to the fact that the first world mm-hmm. is thrown in there? And I'm assuming that there's not like an additional plane for Talos. I saw something about like Numerian steel Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in terms of what their bodies look like. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be very compelling uh, to make uh, Talos characters who are influenced by um, working with sky metals Mm. or maybe a sky metal fell like near their village or maybe there were metals underneath your village and so a lot of people are born as talos i think that kind of a thing is very cool by the way yeah and i think that does mention the sky metal in numeria has led to more talos and it mentions no qual eyes and adamantine hair so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that's that's probably the big one because sky metals are Mm -hmm. popular and that's a good that's a good hook that's a great hook to get your character i also just love talos as the name for the metal genie can it's very cool i just think that that is like i'm not saying ardande is not a good name because it is but Mm talos is just such a brilliant choice Mm -hmm. for a name Mm -hmm. um even compared to all the other genie kid names it's like yes this is exactly what it is yeah it fits this beautifully yeah okay so talos is living on the plane of metal most often build their communities on the outskirts of Zura cities. These neighborhoods tend to be tight-knit communities and are considerably warmer towards other planar denizens than the Alu Zuras. Uh, and then it talks more about specific communities on the plane of metal. So that's the tale of settlement sidebar. We have a couple of random questions in chats. First oh, of all... Yes. The wig adds one light bulk, giving you the clumsy condition. That's my oh. favorite chat. Perhaps, by perhaps. Far. <laughs> it is. It is a hard front wig, not a lace front, so it does have bangs. And I don't want to trim my bangs because I'm not sure how much I want them trimmed by. And as soon as I trim them, that's it. It's that way forever. And I'm worried about ruining my wigs, so like I just haven't trimmed them. So they are a little bit like difficult to manage. So they wanted, and someone wanted to know what is your favorite thing about Lynn. About oh, uh, Linny the Iconic? Oh, Linny. Linny. Sorry, Linny. Um, I like druids are cool in general. I do like druids a lot. I played um, a druid on the Valiant podcast mm-hmm. where uh, Luis was running a campaign set in Arcadia. <laughs> and I really liked about the druid the way that um, it gave you a lot of versatility turn to turn. Where like if you wanted to spend a turn uh, spell casting, you could. If you wanted to spend a turn doing like uh, melee combat, you could. Uh, I played a wild order druid, so I was able to change into an animal, and so that also made it so that like I had a lot of sustainability throughout the day. Where uh, if I was kind of hanging back in an encounter and letting other players do more of of everything but then as a result they took more damage i could heal them or i could cast damaging spells or i could return it to an animal and like flank with the fighter and like just depending what resources i had already spent versus what resources i still had left i could really change the tactics that i was using combat to combat i find that hilarious too because so you wouldn't say that 
you could just only turn into a triceratops and that was the only option mm -hmm. and you just did that and always attacked because <laughs> remember that old video that was just like yeah, Pathfinder yeah. 2 has no choices especially yeah. for wild order druids where you just turn into yeah. a triceratops so yeah I like well to uh we started valiant at like fifth level so that might also skew like what i had access to that's fair so so esther has an interesting comment uh wrote um i'm a fan of both mark and jess's game work and I'm a fan of Steven's extensive knowledge of the gaming world and its corporate structures. So mm -hmm. the, that's why publishers don't get any, uh, any game love. Because not that you guys don't do a great job, but you guys are always forward on actually writing and developing and creating this stuff. But I actually create some game stuff too. I just don't seem to... I get the, I get the weird producer uh, mm -hmm. credit, mm -hmm. so... It's fine. No, it's it's true. There's a re <laughs> if you remember back when like the stuff with Paizo first started, like around when the uh, I mean, obviously you both do, and obviously Jess yeah, yeah. does, since that was around when the freelancers <laughs> were organizing before um, the union. Like I went on Twitter and made a gigantic hours long thing where I just was talking about like the unsung heroes at Paizo because yeah. Steven, you're absolutely right that a specific subset of a company like Paizo or any tabletop company get a lion's share of the um, like sort of the spotlight and the eye that's upon them, but project management and um, editing, like mm -hmm. editing, never is is noticed except for the few times that something like gets yeah. slipped through and so that's like a particularly not great oh position yeah. to be in when i worked i worked on a newspaper in college and i remember that is that we used to talk about that it's like if you do your job right then no one says anything right <laughs> people only say something when you do your job wrong editors <laughs> are, the, are kind of like the are like healers in a certain way yeah. right mm -hmm. and like customer service are the tanks who like protect you against things that are coming in uh the aggro and just like in a video game where everyone's like oh the dps carry the dps carry i think i even made this analogy in my unsung heroes that where i was like yeah. sure like you know the pathfinder 2 design books are are they're the dps or dpr carry <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they would go anywhere if you didn't have everybody else who were doing really important things it's just the one thing that that, that people latch on to um more so and i i totally agree with that that is funny because you know, yeah. i i always play a dps hunter so there you go. <laughs> I'm always yeah. DPS. But yeah, like I, I hate like I, I wrote thinking. a lot of words for Rage of Elements, but everything that I wrote had like a developer, the lead developer for the book go over it, or someone from the design team go over it. And then of course the wonderful Paizo edit team going over the whole book mm -hmm. and just making everything better. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, that happens. I mean, and that, that's just the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. of the people that do things at Paizo yeah. that are important. And to be honest, I don't want to try to reproduce mm -hmm. that Twitter thread because yeah. it, it... It would take a long time. It would take yes. forever. And yeah. uh, because there are so many elements that are that are important that you will always forget. And I might forget one and then feel terrible about it yeah, for yeah. weeks. Oh, I do have a, yeah. a weird follow-up is because, yes, you are a weird producer, Stephen. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I am weird. Hey, man. Hey, man. If you're not weird, what else? What, right, what else, <laughs> but, what else do people want to see? Do you really see someone serious like, doing a job like this? I mean, there's a reason why people, creative people, are so interesting to be around because they're all a little weird. <laughs> Simple yeah. as that. I'm the weird one because I also also have I do the business side too, so that's much more common now. I actually went out with a whole bunch of friends who are gamers, and they're into like business and coding, and they work like on trading systems for like you know stock exchanges, and they're also hardcore gamers. You know, like now it's much more common, but back in the day, all of 20, 15 years ago, you know, I used to have really hide my gaming because people were like, "You're into games." you know like all these suits and stuff it was so weird and they were like it just seemed like you were into that kid stuff and i'm like yeah yeah what do you want i don't know leave me alone <laughs> now so it's a 
That's a little bit more out there. Another section people were interested in seeing was Elemental Allies, starting oh, okay. on page 38. Okay, that's ah. what we'll say, 38. Um, when I asked Burp. what people wanted to see in different places. So I, I think like that the, could be a fun one to show air off. Bird. It's, it's not one that, that that many people have... It was a section that nobody got the as a preview bird. because it wasn't the kinetic assist that it wasn't one of the elements. Ooh, um, there's a metal model so in here. So that means only starting Monday when people could do a review of anything in the book did it become fair game. And I'm not sure that a lot of people have gone through this, but uh, mm -hmm. there's some cool stuff in here. I say, um, having um, having oh, written the, the Elemental Eidolons and uh, much of the Elemental Allies section as well. Oh, you wrote um, this? Yeah. Oh. That's where a lot of my Biased. Um, my contribution is, but I think it's cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm it not the one cool. who, who I'm not the one who decided what was going to be in here. That mm -hmm. was completely decided by um the design team asking for particular things that uh, they wanted to see. And then All um, right. I'm going to go through and see, and I'm going to give my opinion of what I think is cool. Okay. Without knowing what you did. Let's see. We have okay. a water, um, a water walrus, walrus. which mm -hmm. pretty cool. Pretty cool. Walruses, okay, you like the walrus. Walruses always get a lot of love. That was actually one of the most popular and famous species from Starfinder ever. Mm -hmm. The, the Morlema. Oh, Absolutely. People love that thing. Um, Airbirds. I have a soft spot for Airbirds because in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, um, in uh, Jason, Jason's... Oh, but I, I'm blanking on his adventure. Uh, Fall of Plague Stone. There's a mm -hmm. scene in there where you're attacked by birds, like air birds, and they just mess. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, they're they're so strong. The Thunderbirds, and they're really good. So I like air birds. Uh, Fire Lion, kind of cliche. That's fine. Uh, Metal Nautilus. As someone who is preparing to play Baldur's Gate three. With the Nautilus, flying Nautilus, all about the Nautilus. I love Nautiluses. They're so weird. Mm -hmm. And we have a connection to the Nautilus, too, in a little It's true. Piece. It's true. If anyone has looked at the preview for the Kickstarter, there's a secret page, which I've noticed that people have been sharing around. And there is a like a kind of Nautiloid-headed thing called the Cerebrophage that's mm -hmm. based off of the Incutilis monster from Pathfinder, but what if it like evolved and combined into the creature whose head it was on? Mm -hmm. And it made a sort of a Nautilus headed creature that was one composite creature instead of like a parasite on the back of mm -hmm. the head of somebody. I wonder if you had the body of a human and the head of a Nautilus with lots of tentacles. Uh, and it eats brains it because eats brains. that's what Incutilis is that's enjoying. Right. Sounds similar to others. Uh, we have a wood monkey. Eh, I like the monkey. You like the wood the monkey? monkey. Eh, it's all right. It's all right. Okay. You prefer the the walrus? I prefer the walrus, and I definitely prefer the nautilus. And then, what's this guy? I, I wish. What's this little? I wish that the guy? wood monkey were a cat, and that mm -hmm. it were a cat mm -hmm. that had like ferns for whiskers, the way that this monkey has kind mm -hmm. of like a mustache. And then this is like, what is this? A wisp or a scamp? This is cute. I like. I think it's a wisp. I think it's a. It's hard to tell, but I think it's. I, I think like, it's a wisp. Yeah. I, I, yeah so, I mean, so you pretty... decided which ones you liked, and yeah. you said which. But like those are those are you know, the art team and the artists who made those mm -hmm. awesome pictures. Like I had nothing to do with that. So you said which of the uh, ones that that without knowing which ones I did. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter because of the fact that the uh, I didn't have an effect on the art, which is. Fantastic. You didn't give I, art I love. for these? Uh, not... Freelancers usually don't write oh, them really? for Paizo. Oh, okay. uh, because they're they're a separate thing that is done by the designer or developer who's going through the section. There's a variety mm -hmm. of reasons for that, but freelancers are generally <laughs> encouraged, like if you have some art notes of something you need to be true in the art, um, mm -hmm. to like let the designer or developer know. Sense. Um, I, I let people choose, as you know, but yeah, actually, now I think about it, about only actually almost eighty percent don't bother. <laughs> I guess they don't like to do art waters. And, and I we, do the same thing that, that Paizo does, where I tell everybody who's working for us that um, when I'm when I'm commissioning, that it's like the art briefs are not part of your word card on assignment. You're not expected to do them, and I will do them. 
But if there's anything you want to make sure you see, because right. for some authors, the joy of getting that art piece that looks like what they mm -hmm. had in their mind's eye is one of oh, the greatest me. ones. Oh, yeah. And so I was like, if there's something you want to be sure that you see, you can submit anything that you want to of your own accord. Mm -hmm. But this is not something that you need to do. It's not mm -hmm. something you're expected to know how to be able to do to just to complete your assignment. So were you yeah. working on the Elemental Allies, right? When I was telling you about Eldamon, you probably no, were. I oh, was, no, it was close, I was though. working. So the <laughs> first time you ever told me about Eldamon was long before um, Rage of the Elements. Oh, even But yeah, it also strange. was a book yeah. that was supposedly going to be like, at best, kickstarted in 2023 or possibly 2024 based on your old plan where we rearranged it and you um you decided to put Eldamon much sooner so i was mm. thinking at the time that rage of elements started being a thing and i was kind of pushing for because i love elements i was like that'll be cool mm. and then a few years later Eldamon will come out um mm. as well and then there'll be even more elements mm. uh, but then when you moved Eldamon sooner they wound up coming to be closer to each other than before which makes this in a and then pixar made an elemental movie and this is like the year of elements mm -hmm. know, right it's it's, it's got to be fantastic for anyone who loves elements you love elements yeah. this is the year but looking into these elemental eidolons i would say that like this was actually very a very challenging assignment uh to write the elemental eidolon mainly because of the fact that um uh, the amount of word count that was assigned to Elemental Eidolon, as you can see, is not like it's longer than any other Eidolon has, mm -hmm. but it's not that much longer. It has six different elementals in it. So that one was that it was it was pretty tricky because I wanted to make sure you really felt like you had each of the elements in your elemental. And as you can see, when you look in here, there is a specific benefit you gain depending on your elemental core. Um, and then the later abilities are an elemental burst or elemental maelstrom that anyone could love, regardless mm -hmm. of what level you're at. They're kind of the same. And that's because if they changed between the six at any of the other levels, it just wasn't going to work. So like putting the jigsaw together, I realized it's guaranteed that the first level ability needs to give us something special because there's no way you can wait to be able to like swim as a water elemental or something like that. Yeah. And so I immediately realized that the other two therefore could not have something special because it wasn't going to fit. In fact, even to have this much space, I needed to use some of my flex space that was just like this extra space is for anything. We, it might be the Eidolon needs it. It might be that you can put it for something else. And it was like the Eidolon needed it all. So um, that was a very interesting puzzle, and I really enjoyed working on it and being able to figure it out. And I think that um, uh, with what I put in, I don't remember exactly what I put, but what I put in and how it was adjusted by the design team, which I don't remember exactly how it was adjusted, and the editors, what came out at the end is really cool, and I think. And I hope that I um, did a good job with the starting mm -hmm. off for it so that people who love elements can um feel like you can play any elemental and it feels evocative given given all those constraints it was a fun puzzle yeah so nugs not drugs who i think has a picture of the lunch lady from the it simpsons. looks like a simpsons character oh it's definitely oh. simpsons it looks like the lunch lady yeah. any plot hooks for running elemental adventures yeah, I think the best places to look for plot hooks in the uh, the sections on the individual elements, there's going to be a part of each of them that lists like dangerous locations on the plane. Mm. So all of those are basically plot hooks because they're a dangerous place the player characters can go and danger and conflict is what you want for an adventure. So that's like starting on page 64 for air, for example, yeah. with storms oh, okay. in the clouds, I think, has yeah. a lot of the dangerous places. Mm -hmm. mm. And then... Um, each of the elements also has uh, a list of like interesting or dangerous or noteworthy people who there is like something that we wanted to communicate to the reader about them uh, of just like denizens of the plane who are noteworthy. And those sections also, uh, I think, have a lot of plot hooks. Putting on air. Yeah, this thing is this thing is full of plot hooks. Mm -hmm. did, did you write that, oh, yeah. Jess? Did you write putting on air? Yeah, airs? I did. 
Okay. Yeah, of course. Those are great names. Like yeah. putting on putting on airs and um, yeah. storms in the clouds are great names for the dangerous place and okay. for the um, they like the courts and the characters because I immediately could tell what it meant and mm -hmm. it was very very evocative and used the um, elemental puns. So one yeah. was a question for you, Mark, which I think you should talk about. Can okay. you share your philosophy for familiars and specific familiars? And how their roles are compared to Eldil uh Edelons and companions. Sure. Uh I guess so. Like obviously just like in terms of what specific familiars were created here, like I was following the other specific familiars, and I I feel like some of the uh, it's been a while, but I feel like some of these were added um by um during design as part of like the remaster like I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure i did not write the scamp for example when this was going on but um if you mean generically about the difference between a familiar and eidolon and an animal companion if you want to think about it an eidolon is a fundamental part of your summoner's class they're not a mm -hmm. companion they're not a minion mm -hmm. they're you they're part of you they're bonded to your very life force. They share your hit points. It's your entire class identity doesn't really work very well it's without like, it. Like, like you're just like design. a crappy spellcaster who has a few spells and then you cry uh, for the rest of the day if you were like banned from using your Eidolon in some ways. Whereas like if if Jess's druid had a, had a companion, which is a wild druid, mm -hmm. maybe not. But mm -hmm. if if she did have a companion and that companion was killed, like it's like Jess is still a wild druid and could turn into a dinosaur or something. Um, so an Eidolon is a fundamental huge part of you, uh, whereas an animal companion is a um, an add-on character that mostly is used in combat, generally costs a pretty significantly large number of feats, which could matter depending on what class you're in. One thing we didn't talk about with Kineticism that I think is very interesting and makes Kineticism... Mm -hmm. Um, in an extreme compared to other classes. It is probably the most feet-hungry class in existence by a huge amount. By which I mean, if you took whatever happened with, with Jess's druid character, and I said, Jess, you can take one feat from the druid class throughout your entire time as druid. Maybe it's dinosaur form if you really want to be a dinosaur. I am just keep saying dinosaur, but maybe you never did. You can take at most one. All the rest mm -hmm. are going to be like from the dandy archetype and other fun flavor archetypes you're still yeah. going to be a druid that is like i'm still doing all my druid stuff i i i you might not even be able to notice it that much if the kineticist did that and you don't have free archetype but you just only took one kineticist feat ever i think you'd be hurting because the feats add so much um into the kineticist and so it's therefore harder for a kineticist to take an animal companion than for other classes if you're not using free archetype or somehow getting it for free because they have a high feed cost they have an action cost in general or you can eventually get it for no actions that takes one action so if it doesn't need to move maybe it'll take one swipe and it's going to give you some combat benefits now familiars are kind of um they have out of combat uses they can give you some master bonuses honestly some of the master bonuses are so strong compared to the feats that they cost that they would be similar to taking spellcasting feats like getting more cantrips which is like the cantrip expansion feat except for that you can swap it around at the beginning of the day um you can sometimes use them to um do some kind of tricks and gimmicks in combat there's also out of combat uses like uh, they, we, when i'm playing quest for the frozen flame and my el elemental avatar has a little um taper fire taper that follows uh follows her around and can only speak Ignan, and we've determined that only two other people in the following speak Ignan, so it's not very useful. But so, there, we have this NPC we do not trust, and we always think he's going to, like, gaslight us by giving wrong, running away from the party and giving wrong information. So whenever he runs off to go back and retreat from an encounter, I always send my familiar to go talk to the people who speak Ignan and tell what actually happened to make sure he can't, like, seed the wrong information into our group so that's like yeah. something that the the animal companion and the eidolon would not do but the, the familiar could do and i don't care that i don't have the familiar around because i mm -hmm. don't use the familiar to fight 
So they each have different and they each have different roles and you can sort of blend those roles and mix them in depending on what the features of your specific familiar might be. So those those are just some thoughts. They're not like mm-hmm. the be all end all definitive of those uh, categories of things. Yeah, absolutely. And just because you you mentioned like my druid Zudani could only have one druid feat and still like execute on being a druid. I looked up uh, what I actually took, and I did only have one druid feat. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that you did, only took one druid feat. I was mm-hmm. just thinking, based on what you said, I bet we yeah, could do yeah. it with one druid feat. Whereas oh, if you yeah, told I the had... kineticist throughout mm-hmm. your game, you will take one kineticist feat. The rest will must be from like Dandy, or you could take Mauler or Sentinel mm-hmm. or something, or even Blessed One. You would lose so much from kineticist from that compared yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah, at, so at first level, I had I, cho- I chose my druid order, the wild order. At second level, I immediately took the rogue dedication. Okay. <laughs> at fourth level, I had uh, 1,000 faces, so that okay. I could be a shape changer yeah. who also turns into people. And then uh, we got to sixth level on Valiant, so I had basic trickery for trap finder. Basic <laughs> trickery for trap finder is awesome. Mm-hmm. I, like, yeah. I like taking and that I too. Was, yeah, and I was a druid, and I had like a yeah. great perception. So yeah, you, you I, I would also count the freebie feats that are given to you by the class as not being taken the one that you take. Um so mm-hmm. yeah, you only took one um one class feat from Druid. And you probably yeah. could have gone all the way to 20 and still not taken any Druid mm-hmm. feats and had a perfectly workable Druid character that was doing what you wanted it to do. So mm-hmm. I find that that interesting and different. And it's partially because the kineticist feats are so good um, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that it leads to them being, and they do so much of what your character can do. Yeah. Um, as compared to the druid, gets those spell slots for free. Mm-hmm. They're not like part of the feat structure, whereas the, yeah. the kineticist sort of gets their spell things from the feats, and they're very good, and they can keep using them. Yeah, you get some impulses, uh, just as a matter of course, but not enough. You get it some starting tricky. off, and I think you if get you some starting off. If you don't every, choose to take a junction, you can, you can every, pull one out. Every time you fork the path or uh, expand the gate, you get a an impulse. But if you expand the gate, then it's one of your existing elements, and if you fork the path, then it's right. one of the elements that you're picking up. Yep. So you would get another um another impulse every like four levels or whatever. Yeah, you get a you get a few. A that's not as many as you want. Mm-hmm. And some of the feats that are not impulses mm-hmm. are also like yeah. very good. So I think that you would you would feel hard pressed if you didn't take some more from Kinesis, which is is yeah. absolutely a good thing um to have feats that are that good. It's not a bad thing um for the class, but it makes it more different than some of the other classes. Yeah. All right. What other sections do people want to look at? Or what do you want to know? So quiet. Everyone's quiet. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to do a quick ad while everyone decides what section you want. Go into the chat yeah. and we'll be right back. Hi, Barbarian here. Are you a game master looking for an amazing game world rich in lore and strange new creatures to run your D&D or Pathfinder 2 game in? Well, look no further than the world of Battlezoo Indigo Isles. The world of Battlezoo Indigo Isles contains everything you need to set sail for adventure. Except maybe a boat. You're, you're probably going to have to buy your own boat. But the book itself contains a detailed overview of key locations on the Indigo Isles, dozens of story hooks and NPCs, and details on the ancient spiritual religion known as the Eld. Wow, that, that sounds spooky. Don't forget to take your weapons with you. You'll also get 15 new dragons as monsters featuring the entire family of wild dragons from the Battle Zoo Ancestries Dragons book to help you murderize your player's precious characters. And you'll get gobs of new magic items to make them feel like they might have a chance. But they won't, will they? What's more, there are tons of new character options. 10 new ancestries, 10, and new archetypes, and subclasses, and heritages, and seven, 
seven familiars native to the Indigo Isles. Remember, the World of Battle Zoo Indigo Isles comes in two versions, one for D&D 5e and another for Pathfinder 2. Oh yeah, and they're releasing the PDF right after the Kickstarter ends. If you'd like a new fantastical world to amaze your players with, click the link below and back the Kickstarter today. By one, they would have given yeah. the hey, ones that- live. Because hey! You, know, <laughs> you guys are like we're going off on a tangent. So let's see. What do people say? So we had a super chat from Dungs Not Drug that said some people have said this class seems like Paizo has let their hair down with design choices. Do you think Kin is a good bar to set for the future? Like, I'm not really sure I understand exactly where that question is going, but I think that mm -hmm. it's cool to take um, some of the restrictions that you can see and loosen them up. Like for example, um, when making new classes, starting with the APG, like I was very excited to make classes that got like some additional skills built in if they were using that skill. And it didn't really make it through in the APG. And so for Inventor, I kind of was thinking maybe they would have crafting as like a built-in skill. And that didn't make it into the play test either. Uh, because there was kind of some idea that maybe they shouldn't have it because they're mm -hmm. not like one of the double skill increased classes. And that's sort of a benefit that those classes have. The play test for Inventor strongly stated we need to have those built in. So the final Inventor did, in fact, have the built in crafting. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it became easier to put the built in um, increases to the magic skills in Thaumaturge when I was writing Thaumaturge, for example. And so you can see how along the way, when you loosen up a little bit on certain things and you see them and they work and they do something well for a class, that um, it makes it easier to put the, a similar kind of thing into the next class than it was before, because you might not have as much reluctance um, from like the team decision as a whole. Moving forward, you become more comfortable with uh, how the classes work the stability and how things are. So I think that it's not that it's a bar that's moving forward, but it's more that everything is an understanding that's evolving, shifting, mm -hmm. and changing over time. And I think the remaster can be a great place to um, to revisit some of that too. Yeah. So, and also just in general, I think they're getting more comfortable with the system and know how to work within it like anything. So, you know, like the first classes have to be, I wouldn't say the most restrictive, but I'll say they have to be the most careful with. And I think with the remaster, yeah. you're going to see a lot of these classes get a similar treatment. Yeah. Plus letting the space open is sort of, I guess, mm -hmm. letting your hair down because it's not bundled up in to get together. Having more space for the class is kind of crucial to allowing some of these different combinations and effects to work mm -hmm. just like the amount of space that we had for some of those core robot classes was so small yeah. there were only certain things that those classes could do and even then they didn't really get enough beats necessarily to have a lot of choices at all the levels right and that was just a publishing necessity because other than that we were just going to be shaving off magic items or spells to make the classes fit and uh, we wanted to have all those magic items or spells that were in there if anything mm -hmm. there could have been more magic items in in the core rule book too and so like there's always more that you want to fit but in these later books having more space for classes also gives the ability to do things that are more innovative uh with the classes and it's like I know when when I put certain things in Thaumaturge and people are like, this is so cool. I can't believe that it had so many like weird, um, unique things in it. And it's not like because Mark can, um, is writing the unique things. As we've seen, the team that had everybody working together except me produced these brilliant, unique um, class elements. It's mm -hmm. more of I had more space to do that at Thaumaturge. And we had uh, we had known the game for longer. People were more okay with trying things that were a little bit more outside the box. And there was space. Like, design progresses and understanding progresses with classes. And I think that's that's how it goes. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple people who are interested in spells. Uh, specifically, primal spells for Druid, which is a lot of the spells in Rage of Elements. There are a lot of 
elemental spells, which as a consequence means that a lot of the spells are arcane and primal. Can we look at the new elementalist spell list? Maybe, maybe Ooh, that yes. will that will be a way to at least wet our appetite by seeing. Because otherwise, we're going to have to go chapter by chapter just to find the spells mm -hmm. from those chapters. Mm -hmm. I think that will be challenging. Well, I guess give me the page number. Yeah, I'm looking for it right now. Is I've got it on page fifty-five. There you go. Okay. Switch over. There we go. Elemental the elementalist spell, spell list. changes. Here we go. Oh, I see. These are changes. So those would be. Oh, um, okay. The the elemental uh, archetype starts in the section after this. So the elementalist. My bad. The elementalist spell list is on page. Oh no! This is the elemental spell list. This it's is the on elemental page. This is the list. It's on page fifty-five. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's so only yeah. got the it's got the new spells and the ones that um it looks like the ones that changed or um let me see uh, the ones that don't have elemental traits. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, it says here if you have an elemental archetype, your spell list consists of universal elemental spells listed below, plus any spell that is one or more traits of your elemental philosophy. No elemental traits that aren't in your philosophy. Spells from this book have a page reference. Ones from Secret of Magic. Have a superscript and those in player core have no superscripts so. got it so there you go so, so yeah these yeah. are the ones that don't have the elemental trait restriction mm -hmm. yeah and so when it says uh that have an elemental trait from your elemental philosophy what that means is that you can choose to either be an elementalist who subscribes to like air earth fire water as your framework of the elements or you can have the like the five elemental cycle where you exclude air but add in metal and wood two for the price so of you, one i like that and so you get to choose between those two as your character's elemental philosophy and the elements that you engage with though this is also a really good uh design space to create the goblin elementalist who Ooh. subscribes to those goblin elements what, what were they food and Fire and food and fire and sleep. Yeah, sleep. you could. Yeah, this I could see a food, like, fire, and sleep elements. You well, could you, do it. You have like it said that it can change like day to day. So like as a goblin elementalist, maybe when you prepare your spell list, you're preparing uh, what you've decided to classify as an element for that day. So ah. maybe there is a given day where you have classified like horse as an element. Yeah, so I think what you would do there to try to balance it is you might have 10 potential goblin elements and you pick, say, four of those 10 and they're smaller mm. than normal elements because like horse element doesn't have that many. It would have like phantom yeah. steeds steed. <laughs> and uh, and like summon <laughs> animal for horses. Yeah, summon animal parentheses horses <laughs> only um, or equines so only. Um, <laughs> So that you could out. get like other equine creatures that are not exactly a horse. Yeah, exactly. And um, then maybe you would get more than four if it, if the elements only had that many. But you you see what I mean. You would have a list of them, yeah. and you can prepare them at the beginning of each day as your philosophy changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like it's not specified, but you assume the goblin players are preparing fire every day. And but it's like, future. -proof. You don't have to. Like they future proofed it. So if you wanted to do those goblin yeah, yeah. elemental philosophy, you can because it just says pick mm -hmm. the ones for your elemental philosophy. It doesn't say they can yeah. only be uh I mean it implies that you take classical. Yeah, it implies that you take the ones that have the trait for your elemental philosophy. And so like uh Phantom Steed unfortunately does not have, not the, have horse the horse trait. trait. Yeah, you would have but, to add it. Yeah. You but would have to is, add it directly. This is very workable. <laughs> I think it could I think it could work. Yeah. There's already summon giant in here, so you could mm -hmm. get summon animal horse. This is this is yeah. something you could do as a joke product and release yeah, it yeah. somewhere. Excuse me, joke product. Yes, you know <laughs> we 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 are very serious about our joke products here. That's true. That's true. Okay, that's fair. You're talking about my the April Fools. Shocking. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay. So um, we someone see... really wants to see yeah. stuck to the system from Ian World's preview, which is on page number seventy-one. Ooh. Oh, those are no. Those are not joke products. You can use every single one of those products, and yes, people do. That's why I said we're very <laughs> serious about our joke products. They're real products that are completely usable, people which is part play of the joke. Dragon Dungeons all the time is part of the joke. 
So what makes the joke so good? Here's shock to mm-hmm. the system. It's a level seven spell. It's gonna Ooh. bring somebody back to life, or if they're not, they still recover hit points and they get hasted and can do a little bit more than a normal haste. And they can cast one, uh, or they can cast fifth rank thunder strike as an innate spell at will, which I'm not sure exactly what that is. Um, so That's it's pro- crazy powerful. Well, I mean, it depends on if it's a cantrip or a not cantrip, um, probably. And it also makes a cloud, which makes them be um, concealed. Or no, hidden. Flat out hidden. And everything else is hidden to creatures inside of the cloud. Uh, yes. And how I big is the cloud? Strike. Cloud, the covered creature, which is a dense cloud that fills their space. Oh, okay. So the creature that came back to life also cannot barely be seen and they can't see anything else because nobody is, else is in the is cloud a, but them. That is. I almost say that's broken. <laughs> it's two actions. It's, pr- it's pretty powerful. Um, on the other hand, the amount of healing that you're able to do with it is drastically less than if you just did a direct healing spell. So um, wait, it. On the other other hand, it is a cult, which doesn't have all the direct healing spells. Well, but it it's gives a, cult, a haste divine to primal, and if it lasts for one minute, they still come back to life. They don't go, they don't drop dead after a minute, right? Oh, they... people think the thunderstrike is the renamed lightning bolt, so that's actually yeah. pretty strong if it can do a fifth level lightning bolt throughout the entire time while being it hasted. Ra- yeah, dude, it raises you, obscures you. It, 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 it uses it, your it's, spell it's DC. Insane. Actually, there's some really weird that's really things strong. about the fact that it uses your spell DC, that's where you a, could just that's a uh, you can Derek cast it S on level some, tier spell if there was you can ever cast one. it on some kind of throwaway character that happens to be in the fight, such as a familiar, and then they will wind up being able to use your spell DC on this fifth level lightning bolt every round. So, which you can command them as only one action. That's essentially like mm. doing a lot so really that n- now that i know that fifth level thunder strike <laughs> is like not a cantrip there um, is some abusive stuff you could probably figure out like giving it on a familiar could, but that's what, that's what optimizers be, like me figure out <laughs> it could still be like shocking grasp it, you know it, it could it could be an, an electric cantrip and not mm-hmm. a lightning bolt i think it mm-hmm. Like arguably, they might not want to cast a fifth a fifth rank cantrip at at seven uh, when you have spell rank seven available. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's qu- and also like if you put this on a high value target, it is true that a fifth level spell isn't that good for them, but it, it is very spammable since they're hasted. If they're a martial character, they'll still be able to get a strike from the haste. Even mm-hmm. so, um, so there's definitely. Well, I would say the only thing that I find as an optimizer to like, I can abuse this, would be putting it on something like useless that happens to be in the fight, like a bystander, which you might even use it by accident on a bystander. If you're supposed to be like escort questing this bystander and you're like, oh, but the bystander got blown up and we need to make mm-hmm. them not die. How can I bring them back to life? Well, the spell I have for that is shock to the system. And then it's like, well, also for the rest of the fight, they're through shooting up fifth level lightning bolts. It's very yeah. cool. I definitely yeah. love the um, the theming of it, and it does a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of crazy, yeah. powerful spells. I mean, the, even this Temptus Cloak, level three. I mean, yeah, you get a plus three AC, sorry, plus two AC against ranged attacks, but you also have difficult terrain five feet around you, which is amazing. <laughs> that's like, it's like a little moat around you, and that's only level three. That's That's a really good spell. Which one is that? Tempest Cloak. Oh, Tempest Cloak. Yeah, difficult terrain around you is... Oh, yeah, I was on a different page. That's really cool. That's really strong. It's a minute, and it's basically like... A a shield is up kind of all the time in terms of your circumstance bonus, uh, although it is only against ranged attacks. Yeah, but it's not even that. That's, that's like, nice, but that difficult terrain with a five-foot burst is so powerful because it will totally mess up Although what a five foot burst surrounding the target is not as big as you think. Well, it's, it's right not around a five the foot emanation. So, mm-hmm. but it's around the ca- it's around. Yeah, you. but it's a burst. So yeah. that means that it would actually only be 
Uh, if it was oh, actually right, right. surrounding you completely, it would be an emanation. You know what? It's still so good. So actually it's... the only surrounding like three of your I know, but squares, it slows I think, down. if it's a it's, burst. It slows down yeah. the, uh, it slows down the enemies. It's probably, I'm looking at it, it's probably supposed to be an emanation. Since it says surrounding your target and a burst would not surround you. Yeah, yeah well, there we go. Wouldn't surround them. already. And vacuum, I like I mean, there's always a, a few errata in everything. And that's just, that's what it means to publish a book. If you don't do something like our model where you put the PDF out early and have people find them, there's going to be my power a few. To make as little erratas as possible and it still happens. But our It errata's, happens anyway. I know, but our erratas are usually like, oh, you didn't put the reload speed for a crossbow. So it's like, okay, that is even a questionable errata because you know what that is. So that's more of like a formatting issue. Um, I do like a lot of the spells in here. Actually, they have a picture of the Tempest Cloak. Look at that. Ooh. There you go. Ooh, I like the snake people. Uh, the vacuum is good, too. I like, I like things that are not fireball, lightning bolts, but are similar that do similar things. Like, the vacuum mm -hmm, sucks out mm -hmm. the air, and then suddenly you can't, um, you can't breathe. <laughs> Stuff well, like I that mean, is always good. Yeah. The I mean the the vacuum implies that one person is breathing a whole lot. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, but it's... well, yeah, it says you inhale all the air. I know. Mm -hmm. Just like you take all this of air it. is mine. That's like <laughs> uh, what's that like? Big trouble, little China. That guy is like. So vacuum is one that I wrote. Oh, pat yourself on the back. I like vacuum. There you go. Yeah. I like it too. Mm -hmm. I this is one of the ways that like. When you are doing elemental stuff, there like you could write an air spell that is just like more lightning bolts or whatever. But the the vacuum spell is a way that I like of taking you have like a spell that is interacting with air, but doing it by subtracting air from other people. By the way, what's what page is lightning Wait, does, rod? Does on? the vacuum spell just hard counter anything that needs to talk? Because it doesn't have a critical <laughs> success. Oh. I, I I'm curious having having written it was was your intention just that like if they need to talk and so holding their breath stops them from using their abilities, they're just done uh, with with this. Or like they have they yeah, better move yeah. out well, regardless of their saves. Uh oh, they mm -hmm, can't wait. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time each round you sustain Yeah, um let's see, a creature later enters or must attempt a save. And even if they crit succeed, they'll take the success effect because so there's they can't no crit talk, success. You can't cast spells. The uh, best they're going to be is, is holding their breath. A little too strong, Jess. Well, I have the seventh rules, level spell. Yeah, there are rules for um, how many rounds of air you lose to cast a spell, right? Which is all of them. <laughs> so you can cast that spell. You oh, can yeah. If you want to die. Air, you can cast it. <laughs> well, there might be an air item. That would help you with this. That's possible. That'd be that'd be interesting. What happens uh, if you have air bubble on you? And it's and a seven, you to be fair, you. like it's a seventh level spell, and at the point where you did that and sustained it, let's compare mm -hmm. that to a fourth level silence. You could have put mm -hmm. that up on yourself and prevented people from talking too. Mm -hmm. I was just mm -hmm. I was I was curious to make sure my reading was correct, but I believe that mm -hmm. is true that if they need to do mm -hmm. anything that involves their voice. They better get out of there because the, yeah. the be their best result is um, that they can't use it. So but super there, cool. <laughs> I think there is like a reaction that gives you a, a reaction spell that is like you give yourself a bubble of air, right? Oh, yes, it's it's the air bubble spell. Yeah, yeah. So like you could, if you were another person who has command over the air, you could use that and then continue casting spells. Now, would that work? Here's what I would do as the GM, which is not what the mm -hmm. rules actually say. I would yeah. say vacuum is trying to suck up all the air. Air bubble mm -hmm. isn't air. I would say like maybe air. One of them is trying to counteract the other one, and mm -hmm. then just let the two players roll against each other. As my like, I'm yeah. being fair, but not actually running with the rules. But I think that yeah, it doesn't specifically um, it say that. Let's say it's if you don't need to breathe yeah, air, yeah. you're immune to the spell. But it doesn't necessarily say that if you have another source of air that you're okay because it sucks in all the mm -hmm. air. Mm -hmm. It could also be timing based. It's very interesting. Yeah. I love thinking about the implications of having elements work together, which is why I love spells yeah. like this and books like this, because you could just sort of try to do the magical physics in your head, like we're doing right now in this episode. It's just yeah, fun. Yeah. 
I find I have fun with with questions like these. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the interaction between air bubble and vacuum is like a, a GM discretion area. Yeah, I mean, I just made because that up. And you... it's absolutely not a real ruling yeah. on what you should do with it. I do not like, know what would actually happen in, in yeah. the official rules of the game. Yeah, in terms of like order of operation, you could say that you cast vacuum, you inhale all of the air, creating an environment where the other person can't breathe. And then, only then, after the air has been inhaled, then the reaction triggers. And that's when you cast air bubble. And so ah. the, the vacuum effect to consume the air has already occurred at that point. So ah, that, but, that is, but, yeah. But when you're sustaining it, it keeps sucking the air out. Otherwise, so you have more, to cast air would, air bubble more air would rush in. So you would you have, have to, to like, you'd have to cast another air bubble every time they sustained it by that, uh, by that particular mm -hmm. physics and interpretation mm -hmm. that we're thinking of, mm -hmm. uh, which is... I mean, I could see that too, where it's just like every time you do the air bubble, it lasts until the next time they sustained instead of its full duration. There's lots of fun yeah. ways that it could work. Uh, there's obviously no official way that it does. Someone asked a question about like how the 20th level kineticist feet kinetic pinnacle would work with the 19th level kineticist ability, which was um, final gate. Mm -hmm. I think that like you just have both of them. So you get tons yeah. and tons of actions. Yeah. That's my read. Yeah. I don't see any reason why you would not have all of them. And given that one of the things you can do with it is channel elements, like, which allows you to do either of the other two things, then um, mostly it's almost so many of them that you don't. Uh, you don't always need both because if you did want to have the stance up right after an overflow, you could use the quickened action to get the stance. And then you won't need to channel it at the beginning of your next turn because you'll have already channeled it at the beginning of your next turn. Um, which, it, but interestingly, that it does mean that if you get messed up for actions on one of the turns, then you have to use an extra action from quickened to move because you're also hasted while also having the kineticist abilities, then um, on the next turn you'll be set because you still have final gain. So we had some other questions. Uh, they wanted to know your take on this was actually interesting. Uh, lightning rod composed to kineticist impulse. The wording doesn't make sense. Oh. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Mark, yeah, Mark and I can't give uh, rules, uh, like, adjudication. Well, no, like, like, I, I, I gave, like, yeah. a random, like, off the cuff yeah. that I specifically said was not an adjudication yeah. for that rule yeah. because it absolutely does not work the way I said. It'd just be like, a, as a GM, I might do that thing. Um, yeah, but, as, far as, as far as Mark and I talking about, like, vacuum, that's just, like, how would we rule that at our table? That weird uh, corner it, case between two spells. Yeah, yeah. All right. But I guess we uh, won't so that this, one. well, it's possible that it's just that there's something that's being misread. Uh, yeah, which, it, yeah. it is on page um, 37. It's a three action where you do a one action elemental blast using metal on a hit. They are skewered by the metal. They take a circumstance penalty to AC and saves against electricity. If they also have the metal trait or made of metal or wearing metal armor, then the circumstance penalty increases. A hit creature also immediately takes 1d12 electricity damage with a basic reflex save against your class DC. The creature can interact to attempt a DC 10 athletic check to pull the rod free, and then the electricity damage increases. So what were they what were they asking about? Um for this. Uh, I, for this I lightning it. rod. Said... Yeah, I think they I think they didn't say they just uh they were having trouble like crocking. Oh, okay. Well, I mean well, says, keep in says, mind this is not Lightning this Rod. is not an official clarification, yeah. but I don't see anything ambiguous here, so I'm willing to <laughs> talk about it. Whereas if I said <laughs> I see two ways this could be read, <laughs> I don't know which one is right, I would not pick a way. But it sounds like you put down this lightning rod, you spend your three actions on your air composite impulse, kineticist metal primal action. 
Mm -hmm. And um, you're now going to try a one action metal elemental blast of your choice mm -hmm. from the ones that you have. If you succeed, then they're going to take their penalty against electricity, which may be more if they're made of metal, or wearing metal armor, or have the metal trait. And then they immediately take electricity damage with a basic reflex save against your class DC. And they can interact to try to pull the rod out. Basically, so I'm not sure what the question is. Is it like what's the duration if they don't pull the rod out? It well, looks it like here, it's just you smash the metal rod into your foe and call lightning to it and attempt a one action melee elemental blast yep. using the metal element. So, mm -hmm. is that included in the three or do you have to do? Th yeah, well, I mean, anytime an action has a subordinate action like that, it would always be included. Okay. Oh, so. okay, here. I think I understand. So they said, I'm the one who asked. I was wondering if the hit meant if they were hit while the rod was in them by another attack. So I think this is about the way that it says, you smash a metal rod into your foe and call lightning to it, attempt got a one it, action it. melee elemental blast, and then it says on a hit. So I think okay. that just means if your elemental blast hits. Yes, I'm fairly sure because this is exactly how that rules template language works in lots of other places. Mm -hmm. And I've written so many things that say, do a strike or like attempt a, mm -hmm. a spell attack roll against your target's AC on mm -hmm. a hit or on a success, do this. Mm -hmm. So the on a hit, and you know what? Again, not an official clarification by anyone. Yeah. We do not work at Paizo, but yeah. this doesn't look ambiguous to me. I think this is very clearly saying on a hit with the one action metal strike the mm -hmm. metal rod that you're smashing is the metal strike that you're making yeah yeah so reading it that's the way that i read it but it's possible that we could get like an errata to clarify something from yes. there's no way for us to know if that's intended but that, that's still, it seems it seems clear to me yep yeah and they can take it out but they will use up an action and uh, people are asking why DC 10 athletic checks are called for in the book. It feels so low. You might as well just say spend in action. It's just there to show that it takes some effort, like taking an arrow mm -hmm. out of um, your foot from the critical hit success of a bow. It's, it's meant to show that, like, yes, you have to do something about this, but you'll probably, most people could probably do it with one action. But if, if you're, you're really bad at it, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, there's if nothing you're... better than when they. Roll the one on the DC ten. Yeah, and yeah. critically you fail. Could roll and a one. You laugh at them. You could roll a one, or you could be a character who's just not trained in athletics and has a ten strength. Yes, and generally, if you're putting us, so just the way that untrained works in PF two, in the in you know in the play test, you got to add your level, but with a penalty. So it was okay to make somebody do a skill check against, like, say, your class DC or something like that. Then that would be fine because everybody had the skills. Mm -hmm. In the final PF2, you do not advance skills at all if you don't know about them. It's one of the only things you can ask somebody to do other than like their AC if they chose to put on armor they don't have or something like that. Mm -hmm. That they might just be like, well, I have nothing or I have negative, I'm an ooze. And so it's generally a um, can create problematic material that makes you kind of auto win against certain opponents that are weak at the, the ability score and don't have the skill. If you have mm -hmm. like a 15 or a 20 or add your class DC, it's just like, OK, well, you win. If you it's like if you face an opponent that doesn't have that skill and is bad at that ability score, it's over. So you'll see 10 a lot of the times because that's something that, OK, even if they literally have a negative on it they still have a chance of of making it and if as long as they at least have plus zero it's over 50 percent many characters will just get through it and it's an action a single action cost so it makes it a little more dynamic than a pure interact without just being a like a you lose the game and you basically do make certain like certain people lose the game if um if they are put up against um, some of these effects with um, a higher DC on a skill that they can't bring in. PCs, maybe not. They have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. They can pull out a magic item. There are three other PCs who might have the correct skill. Maybe they can get out of it in some other way with one of their feats. But a lot of uh, monsters just don't have that like number of bag of tricks. So it's just like, okay, yeah. 
you're stuck by this thing. And um, I, for in this case, it doesn't matter that much because it just gives them a penalty. But like, let's say it was something that was like, you are stunned and on each of your turns, you could try to end the stun by pulling the rod out. And it's the only action you can take is one time during your turn, you can make a check to try to pull it out. And if not, you lose your turn. Then in that case, if it was a, a, your power DC or your class DC, sorry, was the DC it used, then if you did, weren't, if they weren't trained in athletics, they're just stunned forever. Unless they roll a natural 20, maybe even then. So I think that's why you're going to see that. All right. So I think it has come to everyone's favorite part of the stream. Jess, did you see five elements ninjas? No, not yet. Oh, come on. <laughs> I've been busy. Well, it's part of the elemental aspect of the month. We have yeah. you got to you got to see it before Gen Con so we can talk about it. Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to see it before Gen Con. You're going to be on a plane, right? You have a phone, right? I suppose. Oh, I suppose. You can just watch it on the plane. I think Perhaps. you'll have the time. How busy Perhaps. are you going to be on I don't know. I might also play Pokemon on the plane. Uh -huh. Pokemon? Isn't there a new like Pokemon sleep? So you could sleep on the plane and still oh. play Pokemon. Oh, oh. What Pokemon are you playing? Oh, I'm still playing Pokemon Violet. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Well, because I um, it came out and then I had to like write a bunch of stuff, so I stopped playing it while I was like on deadlines, and so I'm at the moment I'm only playing it on airplanes. Oh my god, that's a real specific. <laughs> How often are you playing here? Like, <laughs> I have things like I'll only watch certain TV shows when I'm working out to make sure I work out, but it's like I'm only yeah. gonna play this one specific game when I'm on an airplane. Well, I don't like to write when I'm on the plane because if I get out my laptop because I have a 15 inch laptop and then if the person ahead of me reclines, I don't want them like smashing the chair into my laptop. So I, I don't really like to take my laptop out on the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, mm -hmm. and so basically you, you'll finish Pokemon in like 10 years unless you fly a lot. Maybe. More than I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the crater right now. Oh, I don't know. I didn't play it. Oh, okay. So, I'm, I, I'm I, at the end game. I've finished yeah. the primary. How much are you even flying if I'm... you're at the end game? Damn, that's crazy. No, I got to the end game before I stopped playing because of deadlines. Oh, uh, I thought it was only on airplanes. Like, no. oh, like, no, no, no. <laughs> see, that's more fun. I did no, have I started... that problem with. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, trails of cold steel i wound up playing it on airplanes i was like well i don't want to waste it when i can Did do you? anything um and but on the airplane i can only use my portable stuff and Did then i got so long from having played it that i'm right near the end but i now like don't remember what i was doing Wait, what what yeah what uh which tales of cold steel were you playing mark trails one um, okay which so is a problem I because have... uh, trails of cold steel one because i have the other wait, ones after that wait. too I have a very similar story. I played Trails of Cold Steel 1, and I played it, and then I stopped. And then a year later, I picked it up, and I played it and stopped. And then a year later, I picked it up, and I finally finished it. It took me three years, and I still didn't know. But you know what? There's a lot of recaps, and the ending actually accelerates pretty quick. because. And then I picked up... Tra trails, you know, I have three, two, three, and four, and everyone says it's so good. And then you saw they just came out with like tales of like a jour. Yeah, or something. the ones that came out theoretically sooner, but were not translated from Japanese well, as they much. Just zero, came out... zero and Azure and stuff. Yes, right. Well, they just came out with that like last week, and that's like the grand finale of all the tales games. And I tried to play two, but the problem with those games is I hate when that happens. Is that like okay, you got all the way up to like the top level and you got everything. And then you start the first, second game, and then they bring you all the way back down, like the first level. And I'm like, yes, oh. it's the bag of holes where you that. like you lose all your gear and you that. get de leveled down. I know. I mean, they, at they, least they always do it. <laughs> at least trails in the sky, you were theoretically the high level that you were mm -hmm. from the first game. Although um, trails the third totally destroyed all of my. Uh, Destroys all of your gear like yeah. early on in there, and it's like, well, now it's gone. I'm gonna start Trails <laughs> Two though, because Trails One really is good. It is a really good story. 
and it is just fun. It's also just a fun, well-made game. Yeah, they're very good games. Very they have good. great stories, and I like them. I just uh, I was it using it as a thing to play on the plane, and that was a mistake that Charles and I, uh, Revere, yeah, I should not have made. <laughs> so someone in Reddit asked if we could show things for monks, and I have searched the word monk and found that it never appears. Well, there so you go. there's we nothing show, that's specifically for monks. We showed it all. We showed you everything that was for monks. Yeah, so, there there are some items, and so yeah, there's some that monks could can use, use but, items. It at but, least doesn't say monk in the item. It's mm -hmm. not like an item that's only for monks. But um, some of the items look like they could be good for monks, like very good for uh, mm -hmm. for a monk. Mm -hmm. So, um, what items would you recommend for? Uh, or or uh, actually, I guess just if we showed the air items, which may be more likely that you know because you did a lot of the air stuff. Would that? Mm -hmm. Do you think we would see something cool for monks? Hmm. He's hijacking it back to the book. Yeah, they're on page 74 that they start. Yeah. All right. I mean, Back I think there's the definitely book. cool stuff in the air items, regardless of whether they are uh, the monk um, or not. But yeah, sure. Okay. I Let's like do talk. it. I like to do my video game talk. All right, air items. I like to hear what everyone's doing in the world of video games. Chad, tell me what you're playing. I'll talk to you while these guys like talk about extra lung. See, sounds, the extra lung is what disgusting. I was saying. There might be an item. Uh, there might be an item that'll help you out with vacuum. Why not iron right? lung? Huh? No, huh? because it's a it's a waterproof bladder of air what? that you wear iron in an lung. underarm holster. Iron lung. That's what I'm I it's like. Connected it. to your nose by a long tube, and you can use it as a source of air instead Why of breathing. Why do you call it a scuba tank? It holds can, wait, can five I use, rounds. Can I use that against vacuum? Yeah, you can. It has oh five God. rounds worth of breathable air, and you can refill it if it's left open for ten you minutes. See, if you were you smart, can switch. you would have. You would have. If you were tricky or sneaky, you would have called it like instead of scuba, the whatever I forgot what scuba stands for. But he came up mm -hmm. with something else, like the mm -hmm. secondary cool <laughs> whatever long, and it spelled out scuba, but it was fantasy based, and people would be like, "Oh, there you go." That's such like a long item name. Well, but yeah, um, you're not doing the so copy you can, fit. What do you care? You can switch because they'll change the name of my item. Then you got to make sure it's just and big enough it. that it fits, so they don't do I that. I don't know what fits. I don't know what fits. I will. I'll do it for you. I have the layout. I can always put it in. I can tell you if you ever want to know if something's going to fit. You ask me. I'll make sure. I can tell you exactly how the copy fit will work. You can always ask me. Anyway, the thing that iron lung does—I mean, the thing that extra lung does—that will help you with vacuum is that you can use the air from the bladder following the rules for holding your breath, but you can speak without losing the air from the extra lung. Ooh, so it's not like a scuba. It's like the suits in, like, um, uh, the abyss, you know, where you have the full face mask and you can talk. Well, it, it connects to your nose, but it's you, you only draw the air out of it when you're actively breathing. It doesn't just lose air as a matter of course. Mm. But... The other thing you can use the extra lung for is it has a reaction where if you breathe in an inhaled poison or other inhaled effect, you can cough the poison or tainted air into the extra lung and then immediately attempt a new save against the effect. But then the air inside your extra lung is, is nasty and you don't want to breathe it. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great way to use the extra lung as an evocative activation for it based mm -hmm. on what you should be able to do with inhaled poisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's my monk's top priority, but in certain situations, like if I knew that I had some kind of disaster character who constantly vacuumed mm -hmm. on the party, I would want to make sure everybody had that item because it's low enough level compared to the vacuum spell that it wouldn't be that mm -hmm. expensive to just have it and be like, yeah, we know Jess's character is going to vacuum. So yeah. we all brought extra lungs. You know, I am, you know, I am. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the soothing wind fan is cool where it can just yeah. do like heal using the fan. Ooh. The floating tent I know was like, you, you oh, said yeah. was like, within your mind for for oh yeah so long. yeah i am i am obsessed with like the the diamond shaped planar tent like that that thing has a, a long edition history <laughs> that was the picture of it 
on the screen now. There is a picture. Yeah, EN World shared. I think it was EN World who had the air preview. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm showing it now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, as soon as they shared it, I was like, oh, I, I'm going to tweet about this. Mm -hmm. I feel like that um, a monk could enjoy the Jothum scarf for uh, vanishing with invisibility once Ooh. per day. And certainly a battle dancer swashbuckler would like getting that yeah, performance yeah. bonus with the scarf. Yeah. There's also a bunch of um, like bottled breath items, with, like the the what are they? The storm breath and nimbus breath, frost breath, so on and so forth. And they are items where they have something in it that you inhale, and while you are holding your breath with that, it gives you a certain effect. But then there's another effect where you can exhale it for a given effect. Oh, neat! That's that's pretty cool. And then it, it talks about um, the maximum number of rounds you can hold into it using mm -hmm. the holding breath rules. All mm -hmm. of these different of these different breaths. Um, then there's there's also these cool little spun clouds that they make on the elemental plane of air, where um, it looks like it is a type of bottled breath, but that it has like a variety of different versions of it that have an effect when you exhale them rather than when you're holding them in. Ooh. So yeah, there's th that's really cool. I like the idea of having like little mini puffy clouds that were mm -hmm. made on the plane of air that you could breathe out yeah. on people to do different effects. That feels very air to me. Yeah, and I feel like as a monk, you would be able to hold your breath for quite a long time. So you would be able to maintain the effects of those for a while. So someone wanted to see the gun played from the fire. Yeah. You know where that so is? So go to page 123. It's on 123 and 124. It's it's split across the two pages. Uh-huh. Jess just knows what page the gun played is on. Is that Obsidian well, I, Edge? Yeah, I have, yeah I'm, I've memorized it. You have to uh, memorize no, I saw the. <laughs> I saw the question and mm. I scrolled to it because oh, okay. I knew which item that was because I wrote it. Mm. Oh, it's split across. Ooh, I hate when it's split across spreads like that. It's yeah. got Obsidian Edge, Greater Obsidian Edge, Major Obsidian Edge, and True Obsidian Edge. Mm -hmm. I can do this mm -hmm. and you can see both at the same time, kind of. Kind of. That is cool. Yeah, yeah. And then I think there might also... Yeah, there's a picture. Oh, okay. Let's look at the picture. On page 125. We've got some Ooh. pictures of some fire items. Every 10 minutes that for one cool. action, magma coats the light blade completely, exploding out of your weapon in an emanation and dealing some additional damage. Is that is that a mm -hmm. Final Fantasy VII gun blade, basically? That's what it is. Well, I mean, a gun blade is a gun blade, right? Yeah, yeah. that's what the item that from Guns and Gears is, the Final Fantasy mm -hmm. VII, mm -hmm. uh, or eight. Eight gun blade, not seven. Eight, eight, eight yeah. Uh, yeah. Spark shade parasol. That I do like. Oh yes, I wrote that too. That that is funny. I do like that. I mean, you have to have a good parasol to br bring yeah. along with you. Oh it's God, very it's important. Gold pieces in, in fashionable. Well, yeah, but in fashionable society, that's easily worth it to make sure you have mm -hmm. a parasol that will protect you from fire. Yeah. And it, it gives you resistance fire, and you're protected from mild, severe, and extreme environmental heat. Yep. Pretty cool. And you can get, be, be more protected with the reaction um, for at least one mm -hmm. minute out of every 10, which is probably the only times mm -hmm. that you'll need it. And for two mm -hmm. actions, you can release the flame when you have it to do some fire damage. Mm -hmm. So even if you never yeah. do that, you basically have fire resistance 20 essentially mm -hmm. on demand uh, it, unless you needed a reaction for something else because mm -hmm. most of the time one minute every 10 minutes is as a reaction is going to have you covered yeah yeah that's cool yeah so it's like you use your parasol to block the fireball right mm-hmm and then it's on fire like in the art yeah all right, I'm gonna go. It's kind of chillaxing with the red and the black too. I mm -hmm. could easily see mm -hmm. someone in Chelyax using that and just like spinning it around to block a devil's fireball or something like that. And like, ah, oh, devil, stop, stop throwing fireballs at my parasol. Yeah, Abigail Thrun could could 
rock one of these. It's an inexpensive oh, yeah. item for her. Yeah. So I like metal. Uh huh. Personally, because it's so weird. They have a it's guitar great. here. A guitar made oh, of metal. Oh yeah. Wait. I mean, you is have there to. art? There is art. <laughs> you have to. It's so How silly. Can you not? It's so yeah. silly. It's a dark, shining guitar. What does it do here? Uh, what does the dark, shining guitar do? The resonant guitar? Yeah, resonant guitar. Okay, so it's a 12th level uncommon item because it is resonant and it is resonant to the plane of metal. So you can use it like a tuning fork type situation for interplanetary mm -hmm. teleport to the plane of metal. It gives you performance bonuses. It is going to... Um, also give you um the magnetic tune that gives you the thundering rune for one hour and then it has a quarter protection as a reaction that um will make it give you a bonus to ac that if it hits if you still get hit they take sonic damage because it makes like a music chord sound barrier Ooh. So, is, I mean, that's silly. pretty cool to me. That is maximum silly. I mean, it's the plane of metal. You have to. I know. I know. I know. That's why I'm like, I think the guitar looks cool, but it's kind of like an old fashioned guitar made of metal. I think with a chain on it, I would have made it a little bit more like. I, I think it, sh it should be old fashioned because it's like a fantasy guitar. It's not like a modern guitar. It's from the plane of metal. Yeah, but it's the plane of metal. Mm -hmm. is metal. And man. they've been sealed like away for guitar. so long. They're so behind on guitar technology. Yeah, yeah I guess so. They are. How would they have the most up to date guitars? They would have weird ones. They have nothing to reference it off of. So it's like. Well, their guitars would look like bizarre. It would be like, what is that thing? It doesn't even look bizarre like a guitar. guitar is actually a good name. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's a bizarre guitar. <laughs> like, what is that thing? It's a bizarre guitar. I yeah, I do like the metal. The metal is actually the whole metal section is just weird, which I like. I like it's weird. great. Yeah, I know. I like it because it's weird. It's like a lot I... of weird. Who stuff. did the metal lore? Was that Andrew White? Andrew White. Yeah. Yeah, it's I, very, very cool. It's very I cool. absolutely love if you go to page uh 135, the first page of the metal lore section, I love just the way that this begins. Just like, can you feel that? The tingle in the air, the subtle scent of iron on the wind, the gentle pull of a thousand overlapping magnetic fields? No? What a shame. What exhilaration you must feel. To finally see the glorious plane of metal open once more to the multiverse. And what a crushing disappointment to find yourself physically incapable of basking in its glory. Oh, but look! Do you have a compass? Look, see how the little needle spins. How delightful. But no, that is not at all the same. Please put it away now. I was I like, she, I was I like, I'm like, she gonna begins. keep it. I was just read the whole damn thing. Alright, we're gonna no. we're gonna be sitting no, here. I... Hey, we're dramatic gonna listen, reading we're of gonna these. Listen to uh, Jess these read awesome. yeah. the elemental range of elements. I the just, whole book. There was a, they, a YouTube guy who was reading the original, like uh, Dungeon Masters or Player's mm -hmm. Handbook or something, from the beginning on a stream. He was reading the whole thing, and I remember it was yeah. live. And I went to watch him, and then I came back like eight hours later, and he was like, page yeah. 14, because the font of that thing is like four-point font. It's so small. I was like, oh my mm -hmm. god. It will take him a year to finish that book. It's so dense. Yeah. But This book is so cool. There's just like every yeah. time we turn to another page, there's something that's awesome. Mm -hmm. right, well, we yeah, can't... Like Reject really liked um, your dramatic read of the book, too, Jess. Yes, everyone liked oh, your dramatic read. Turn it into a. Well, I mean, a, into a. Andrew did a wonderful job on this section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't do this forever because I have no. to go play pickleball. By oh, the way, makes sense. if mm -hmm. people don't know what pickleball is, you're all going to learn because Bed Bath and Beyond, which went out of business, was bought up 
by Pickleball USA, and every single US, uh, every single Bed Bath and Beyond is turning into a pickleball court. Oh my god! Oh wow! I didn't realize that that's what happened. I yes. knew Bed Bath and Beyond went out of business, yes. but I did not know that they're now pickleball. They're, well, they're turning yeah. them into, and that's a lot of pickleball. That's a lot of pickleball. That's a lot. It's really it's maybe more pickleball than is necessary. No, strictly. it's so much fun. It's the fastest growing sport in the world by like a mile. It's incredible. It's really fun. And it's, um, well, if you play, I mean, I've been playing tennis for 35 years, or 40 years, or 45, I don't know, I've been playing tennis a long time. If you play tennis, it's really, really fun, because it's like, like, basic tennis, and so you, it's the fun of tennis, but not as big. <laughs> and if you don't play tennis, mm -hmm. and you just want to learn something, you can get very good pretty quick. Like, you know, there are definitely levels, like, you have a long way to go, but at least you can be competent like within just a couple of lessons and you could actually like play play very well like tennis can take years before you actually get really good so <laughs> the beyond, beyond was pickleball, was pickleball this pickleball. whole time that was a good one. i'm gonna use yeah. that joke it was bed yeah. bath and beyond yeah. what was the beyond pickleball pickleball <laughs> of course it was pickleball. pickleball what else would it have been yeah that was the beyond as my as my <laughs> final uh the thing to share from the book, uh, Amorphous Ursine said, I love the air forward. Uh, I love it too. And it has maybe one of my favorite things that I wrote, uh, which as soon as this, uh, the, the first page of the air forward was shared in the, um, the Paizo primal previews, PaizoCon blog, I like immediately I'm on Twitter, like tweeting out the line, uh, mortal minds are filled with cute understandings of air. I suppose you wish for me to separate the truth from falsehood, but asking this of a creature of air would misunderstand our nature. When you see a vessel and think it empty, air is always within. Oh. And that is like my favorite summation of like, oh, bitches think that air is in an element. Go I ahead. You, I hope you bring your A game when you write stuff for me. <laughs> it's, it's a very profound seeming statement that, mm -hmm. that really gives you a sense of air and it also gives i guess gives you a sense of like this particular in-world narrator mm -hmm. like maybe having that animus against the uh mm -hmm. the wujing cycle that does not include air as an element being like mm -hmm. why are you le you're leaving out air because it's the emptiness it's, and you think it's not an element well mm -hmm. think about it from your mortal perspective is like is mm -hmm. very cute it's very mm -hmm like one dimensional compared to the multiverse yeah. so i that's a yeah. really cool line yeah and then it goes further into like uh in tin shop mortal elementalists believe in a cycle of five elements eternally feeding into each other fire wood metal water and earth unlike these five air has no solid form this is the true distinction understood in our exclusion from the cycle other elemental philosophies do call us an element in equal standing this discrepancy is ideal There you go. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. yeah, because this character is just so sort of arrogant about air. Yeah. That they're just yeah. like, listen, you thought we were just making that comment there about that other cycle, but actually we like that better because it it, it elevates mm -hmm. us above all the other elements. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean air air is definitely like the least understood because if you remember back when Legend of Zelda the Windwalker was released. Um, it was a big part of that was to show because you're like, you know, sailing a, a sailboat and they're like, well, we wanted to show air and like see mm -hmm. this thing that's impossible to see and make it part of the game. And I, I remember mm -hmm. that was like, wow, that was a really cool aspect. And you actually can see the unseen and make it part of it and harness it. And it's like, now you kind of take it for granted in some of these games, but, um, that was the first time they really tried to like use air and and have a vision inside of a game so yeah. yeah i agree i think air is like considered i don't know the one that people forget about because <laughs> it's just like mm. hey what can air do i'm like huh air, air can do a lot trust me <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. air is awesome air is you know it's unbound oh uh, yeah 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 there's a there's another part uh hmm, where is it Oh yeah, uh, air is flexible, mutable, and invisible, an ideal element for spells and magical tools. Pomp and show have no purpose in my work, and an, elemental, and an elemental air is 
Uh, and elemental air is perfectly suited for slipping by while drawing minimal attention. Do you breathe, mortal? Air can give life with but a breath, or strip that life away with the same ease. Hmm. Clearly a threat. I'm just, yeah, I'm I'm so delighted by the like mm -hmm. this narrator is just like kind of like just like uh, I would say like there was there is the comment about um uh Sundare Airzul. Uh I yes. I don't think so. I think the the air narrator is the is the Sundare. Uh, I see there is Sundare. <laughs> mm. Uh I don't know though because does this does this narrator actually like you? Uh, the narrator goes on to, like, warn you about dangerous places and give you advice on dealing with genies. I guess. So they'd be like, it's not like I like you or anything, but let me give you some advice <laughs> about these genies. But just like, yeah, just like, giving you advice on how to survive on the plane of air, but also, like, every statement has to be a veiled threat. So, by the way, we are going to be doing another stream tomorrow. Ooh, what's it about? With Derek Melinda. Okay. Your favorite person in the world, Jess. What what's it about? We are going to build an island with Je with Derek. Nice. <laughs> We're going to see whether he has the writing cuz Derek says he can't write. And that you know he what? He doesn't have to write. Right, He's going to come thing. up with you an idea write. for an island. That's the point. That's why I want to go through with it. I will write him. it. Yeah, he he always it's funny. He's like, "Oh, I'm not a great writer. I can't write blah blah blah." I'm like, "That's fine. It's like we'll go through it." You don't need to write it. Well, let's just, but you have a lot of good ideas. I'm like, that's, you know, you, you can be a good DM or creative person with a, like, not everyone is good at every aspect. And no one is good at every, at literally every aspect. Yes, that's Even true. someone <laughs> with as many weird eclectic interests as the three of us here on the stream who do a whole bunch of different stuff. All of our strengths and weaknesses for me, maps. Oh boy, I cannot draw a map. Yeah, like, ever. I think you said math. I was like, no, really? No, math is your weakness? No, no, I, no, I no, disagree no. on that one. If math was my weakness, then <laughs> I, 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 we'd be I in a lot of trouble. My, yeah, that, everyone would be in trouble. I said maps. <laughs> maps. Or generally art. Anytime I have to draw something and have mm. it be artistic, absolutely not. Like, I can do it, maybe. I can get something that you look at and it's like, I guess I can use that. It's fine for a submission. But to do that would take me, like, up to, like, 50 times longer at the maximum amount of time to get it, like, actually good enough that you're like, I guess that's fine. Uh, then it would take, like, a lot of other people who can do them quickly. Mm. Whereas, like, I would be able to write tons and tons of words of, um, like, game design that someone else might be able to draw tons of maps uh, faster than me, but would take longer to write the game design. So we all have strengths and weaknesses. Someone said, and it's okay you if said you can't naps. write the words. I'm bad at math and naps. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> Alex, I I bad naps, and so I was too tired because I couldn't take <laughs> naps. You know what? I'm bad now. I, is, uh, I am bad at naps. If uh, I fall asleep, really? I'm going to be out for hours. I'll tell you why. So uh, the Army did a study um mm -hmm. to figure out the perfect time for naps mm -hmm. uh, because if you have too much or too little it will mess you up and i mm -hmm. think it was like 22 minutes and i forgot the other number but the other number was much higher it was like an hour and a half or something but if you do take mm -hmm. a nap just do it for 22 minutes and you'll yeah. be refreshed but you won't be groggy uh, yeah so there you go when in doubt <laughs> Look. Naps, my favorite goblin element. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. There's so many things that the government has done studies on, and it's mm -hmm. uh, you can always learn. That I, that's what I have learned. I've learned to look at government studies because they they have studied some weird stuff. And 99.9 percent .9 is for the military. So there you go. Mm -hmm. But they actually put some mm -hmm. work into it. So, um. All right. Well, tomorrow, I think we'll probably do the same regular time, 3 o'clock. And then Derek, I'm sure, will have his rage of elements. He did, like, a huge stream, and all he did for mm -hmm. hours was talk about the kineticist. kineticist. <laughs> yeah. That's yep. it. And he loved it. And hey, we were on here for two hours, closer to two and a half, that we talked mm -hmm. about a variety of different things that people asked to see in chat. So I hope you got to see something interesting and different uh, from our stream based on the ones that you asked for and wanted to see so that we could use the live stream to be like interactive and um, 
go back and forth with all of you and have mm-hmm. a fun discussion about this content. I hope it, it gets you really excited about Rage of Elements, which is an awesome book, and that um, I guess a lot I know a lot of people are looking forward to. I would be too, yeah. except for I already I have it, so I don't have to look <laughs> forward to it. That's right. We 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 already did, and now we have it. And now you don't need to look forward to it anymore, Jess, because I remember you were all antsy because you didn't have it, and now you yeah, have I it. wanted to see how everything turned out. Yes, and now all you have to do is go to Gen Con and bask in the glory of the books. Yeah, and then Ken and- says that basking in the glory of books is the, called the rave of elements. Mm, <laughs> that what you're gonna do? You're gonna be raving. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Are you bringing your Sharpie with you, getting ready to sign the autographs? Well, I I had a request, so I'll have to. There yeah. Go. There you go. You can't say, you, who are you to deny your fans? That's right. Mm-hmm. And people will easily be able to tell. You see, that was something else last year when everyone had masks on. It was, it was very hard to find who was who because you have a mask on, you know, like you're robbing a bank. But you have your hair, so everyone will know who you mm-hmm. are. Oh. Yeah, I'm very recognizable. That's why I had to get my hair freshly done if I'm going to the con. Or you could just say on your on your mask, say, I am just author of Rage of Elements. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, even though you are right that most people who go to Gen Con generally do go there after robbing a bank, it makes it easier to afford to buy a lot of cool mm-hmm. goodies on the dealer mm-hmm. hall. Hey Amen. The yeah. dealer hall is no joke. I've seen people spend at Origins... Oh, yeah. I think mm-hmm. the Knights of Last Call guys spent a couple thousand bucks each. Yeah, and what I'm saying <laughs> is if they had just robbed a bank, it would be easier to, yeah. to spend that money because you feel like it's not your money at that point because it was literally someone else's that you just robbed. Um, and in the convention, it's going to pass through so many different places. Who knows where it went? Okay, I guess we're finding out a lot about Mark today and where his mind goes. <laughs> He's like, wow, there's so much cool stuff in this convention. If only I had some money. <laughs> oh, where's my mask? Where's the nearest bank? Let's go. Time I to... mean, I'm just ripping off of what you were saying about everyone looked mm-hmm. like they just robbed a bank, Stephen. Well, so, yeah. you know what? There used to be this thing where I, I still think about that. It's like when people started to wear masks, cause they said, when you first enter a store, could you please like tip your mask and show us your face? So we like for mm-hmm. the for the camera, and people were like, "No!" <laughs> I was like, "I was like, people were really upset because I was like, wow, that I is know. kind of an interesting thing. If everyone's wearing masks and you go into stores, and it really does work." I was like, "Oh, but yeah, this is one of the reasons why I don't know why people are so quick to give up masking. Personally, I think the uh, reducibility for the government to surveil me at all times is wonderful." Yeah, but they they use they 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 don't even need that anymore. They they can tell you just mm-hmm. it's actually mostly by eyes now. Um, yeah, all the government surveillance stuff. Mm-hmm. I actually worked on a project called um, it was like Eye Tracker or I, I forgot what it was called. Um, but it was a tracking system just for eyes, and that was like fifteen years ago. So Lord knows how mm-hmm. what Lord knows, and it was impressive then. So by now, it's probably they can see you from space and track your by your eyes. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, most likely. Yeah. With that, time to go get ready some bed bath Enjoy and your beyond pickleball. pickleball. And yeah. one day in the near future, I'm sure Jess will be on here once more. Mm-hmm. So. But if you want more content, uh today is Wednesday, which means there will be a new episode of Legend Lore tomorrow. And it's going to be uh the highly anticipated Leshies episode. Ooh, oh, Leshy's episode. Leshies. That is highly anticipated. Got mm-hmm. it. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And do back the Kickstarter if you want a free dice case. It's today. Today's it. We're getting close to 50,000. And, and the dice cases mm-hmm. run off at like what, 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. tomorrow. So, I mean, you can still back hours. it, but you're just not going to get a free dice case. And, yeah. And the I dice case might have 50,000 in the first quarter. The dice 48. case will more cost mm-hmm. as much as the. Um, it's like almost half the pledge itself. So, 
Yeah. I mean, if you're going to back anyway, you should back now. And because <laughs> Steven said that he's doing it based on the uh, the time that you back, yes. you can back it just like the $1 tiered now in case you're not sure yeah. what and you can change pledge later. you want. And then you can change your pledge later. Yeah, I, it's, it's in the and, FAQ. People ask that yeah. all the time. I do that. That's a really time. smart way to reserve your dice case. I, I didn't even think about that exploit. I'm supposed to be optimizing everything, but that's a, that's a great way to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's always uh, always for the exploits. That's uh, that's the name of the game. And then we will um, we will book some time at Izzy's and Harry's. Yes. And we can and you can and they have outdoor seating. I forgot to tell you just yeah. before we got interrupted, yeah. but they have outdoor seating. Yeah. And they have yeah, the same outdoor seating. Menu. Outdoor seating is good for me. Indoor seating, I'm not going to do, but outdoor outdoor dining on like a patio, that's good. Yeah. It's, and it's right across the street from the food trucks. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. where it is. So it's pretty Well, close. I think they moved that for this year. They they moved the, the Gen Con block party. Oh, so really? I'm not sure if the food trucks are also moved. I, hope but they I do did. know that that was kind yeah. of a, it's 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 actually quite annoying because it gets really it's crowded. a very it becomes a very crowded congested area. It's yeah, very tight and it's like super if hot. you're just trying to walk through, it's impossible to get through the food truck lines. And it's very hot, like really hot mm -hmm. on that area. Mm -hmm. So I do not like it. If anyone's going to Gen Con, I have two talks. Just look up Roll for Combat and you'll find my talks. And Jess might even be there for one of them. I have two talks now, Jess, so you can oh. see two of them. Mm. I will have to. I'll have to look up what the second one is. Uh, but I, I have a, a lot of Gen Con plans because I have this World of Darkness LARP that I go to on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, starting oh at God. five p.m. Nice. <laughs> That's intense. No, oh yeah. Well, it's a it's a great LARP. Wow, really? World of Darkness? What do you get yeah. to play? Yeah, I you get to choose what they give you. I, I made a character. Uh, I made a character last year. They do this LARP every year. And so I'm playing like my same character from last year. And they have like a Discord server to do like role play scenes and stuff in the interim. And so like in the time between uh, joining last year and then coming back this year, uh, my care my changeling character like joined the shadow court and everything. Hmm. Wow, changeling. I never hear of those. Mm -hmm. That's like well, that was one oh, of the yeah. books that like they did vampire, then werewolf, and then ghost and mm -hmm. changeling. Changeling's cool. Yeah. Linda and I are playing yeah. a, a C20 game. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh. yeah, it's it's by far the one that nobody does compared to the other ones. It's cool. Mm -hmm. so it's Shadow Court, so all about overthrowing everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my character is uh, Nadine Holiday, the heiress to the Holiday Inn. Uh, she's okay. like oh kind of a, a Paris Hilton riff, right? Yeah, I was about to ask if it was a Shadow yeah. Court Paris Hilton. Yeah, would, yeah, yeah. I would yeah. probably do a adventure vampire. That's mm -hmm, what I usually mm -hmm. play. I like them a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I like the vampires. And when I initially heard about this LARP, I didn't realize that it was like all of the, the uh, darkest world. books. Wow. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna play vampire. I'll make myself like a Malkavian or something. And then I was presented with the opportunity that, like, I could make a changeling. Does anyone there play a Wrath? A Wraith? Ooh. I mean, Wraith I'm would be in there. Sure. I don't think Maybe. So. Or which version of I'm it is sure. this? Is it 20th? Uh, this is, or is it... Um... Um, they have a lot of stuff that they've kind of had to uh, make them make for themselves. Ah, they they're doing it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that might be for the darkness. best anyway, because World of Darkness mm -hmm. has a ton of really good lore, but its mechanics maybe are not, like, always yeah. the smoothest to use in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also the LARP rules don't always get updated at the same time as, like, the tabletop right. rules. So maybe they have a wraith, we don't know. Yeah. Oh, well, I gotta I go, because I'm getting yelled at. Yes. All right, enjoy your pickleball, Steven. All right. Bye. See you guys.